So the history of Yasanet and the Yasa Gateway. So this was basically about the first permanent computer connections for science and research between East and West. So this was during and after the Cold War era. But <clears throat> what is important that this was 10 plus years before the Internet. Well, this is the pictures of the International Institute for Applied System Analysis, IASA, in Schloss Luxemburg in Austria. So this was a famous, one of the famous castles of the Habsburgs. So actually it was, as I said, the Habsburg castle. And this shows uh, the place of this International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, which was moved there in the early 1970s, after it was inaugurated and founded uh, by Eastern and by Western powers, especially the United States of America and the Soviet Union. But also Eastern European countries have joined and uh, Western European, uh, Canada, England, etc. The outline of this talk, well, first of all, this will be not a short project on NORALAC, so I would like to talk about the project goals of the YASANET. Then I would like to go a little bit more in detail what I thought at that time, and then how uh, this YASANET project became the YASA Gateway project in 1978. And that was an absolutely crucial time when finally the project took um, an interesting new direction, but it is very important. And of course, then some history, some organizational aspects of the YASA Gateway project, and then what were the IC ICT applications, um, and uh, which went hand, hand in hand with other YASA related studies. Then, of course, if you do transport at laser flows, as this uh, YASA gateway was all about, then you immediately find some political aspects that had to be somehow solved or have to be met with. And then also the starting of the transport at data flow studies. It, this was all at the beginning of the 80s uh, at YASA. And last but not least, I made a comparison between the Internet and the YASANET and the YASA Gateway. Of course, these were two completely different animals, but it is interesting to see what YASA Gateway, YASANET was and what YASA and YASA Gateway was not. And Internet, everybody knows the Internet, so this is always a good uh, comparison, comparison possibility. Well, and then afterwards, then of course, then some summary and then some lesson learned. Well, the first phase, of course, of the Yasanet, I'm talking, it was our planning. So, as you will see, this planning took a rather long time, and actually I will show it to you. The, the concrete planning into a concrete project, into a concrete network, well, that was not successful. And why it was not successful? Well, I will talk about it a little bit in a few minutes later. Anyway, so this is the planning of the Yasanet. Well, before going into that, uh, let me tell you something about Yasa. So Yasa was created in 1972 as an interdisciplinary, international, interdisciplinary East and West Research Institute. So interdisciplinary mean, meant that it was not only information and communication technology, so ICT related, but also energy, environment, uh, food and agriculture, human settlement, management and technology. So many, many other disciplines were also included. But what was the important thing about it, that it was done in an interdisciplinary manner. Interdisciplinary meant that you had to deal with, at the same time, more than one discipline. And then you took into account, you know, how these this disciplines influence each other. I think this type of study is extremely important. It is rare today. Very few uh, research institutes are interdisciplinary, but it is very much needed. 
And it was in the East West Research Institute because, as I said, the constituency, when it was created, it was done on a political level, basically by the former uh, Eastern European and by the by the former, not the former, by the West European uh, countries, including North American countries like the US, Canada, and also from Asia, Japan. So soon after its establishment, so YASA inter interested, became interested in computer networking. You know, so when the institute was created, and of course, yes, you took, uh, um, yeah, you, you made a list, you know, what could be the interesting project. And then as an interesting tool, uh, YASA networking, it came up. So this is what I found on the base of documentation. So this was the time, was the time when I was not present at YASA. And, and uh, uh, all what, what I know about this is basically on, on literature and on what are my, my colleagues at YASA told me. So as early as in 1973 and in October 1974, so there were already uh, two institute organized conferences with computer networking pioneers, including Louis Buzan, who was the director of the French network Siglat, Viktor Glushkov from the Soviet Union, actually, if I remember correctly, from, from Kiev, then Vince Cerf, the famous uh, founder, not founder, but one of the key, uh, famous people of the ARPANET, which, which was the, uh, the, the original of the today's internet project. Then Peter Kirsten, who was a British scientist, and his role also in, in uh, early protocols, uh, networking protocol and early uh, ARPANET, it was very influential. Donald Davis, the same, he was also a British scientist who tells Sierra is the packet switching. And then also his colleague, um, um, Mr. Barber, also from the from the National Physical Laboratory. So many, many Englishmen, many Americans, um, also some Eastern European, and they were all very famous people, and they all came to, to Yaza and to participate in. So why did I come to Yaza? Well, it was a very, very short group, uh, a, a small group at that point in time, the computer networking. And it was not really the internet yet that we know today. It was really just in the in the core infancy to make some computer networking. So the project had its beginning in 1973, so very early on, at a, at a research planning conference of computer systems. So they have heard, held conferences at the beginning, you know, what should be the main subject of YASA, and this was very much uh, early on in the discussion. So as a result of meeting uh, with Computer Institution in Hungary, so that was the Computer and Automation Institute of, in Budapest, uh, called in Hungarian abbreviation Staki, and of, at that time Czechoslovakia. In Czechoslovakia there was a United Nations Automation uh, Computing Research Center in Bratislava, and so it has become very clear at those conferences that uh, it exists a concrete possibility, opportunity, and also a certain need to establish, uh, establish the basis of a computer network project. And uh, it should be also uh, with a task that it, they should create a new computer ne network, actually, for uh, direct uh, communication resource and need for the YASA scientists. So they saw themselves not only as a scientific organization, but also as a service organization. So with, with uh, that hope, they hoped, you know, to, to encourage and to enhance the research activities of YASA. So there was an obvious need for data communication facilities because of the difficulties experiences in exchanging information between YASA and its national member organization and between, between the NMOs themselves. And uh, in accordance with the aims of the project to improve and uh, facilitate cooperation between YASA and the home institution of the scientists, 
a proposal for preliminary computer network was drawn up to enable EASA project to carry out pilot studies in cooperation with remote uh, in, uh, computational centers. But it also aimed to provide the necessary experience and to expand and improve such a communication in general. The latter was important to the, uh, to the decentralization of YASA research and to widening its fields of, in of, of influence. At YASA, there were at the peak, I, I believe, about 200 scientists and of course there's uh, research supporting material, but of course the, the bigger or a very big group were, uh, of scientists were working outside of, of YASA and uh, with, with the help of a, of, a, of a network, of a scientific network. And of course, in order to have a good tool for the, uh, for the scientific network to intercommunicate uh, with each other, uh, uh, such a network uh, as YASA Net would have been uh, very influential and a good idea. Well, it was very um, interesting that the costs uh, had to be shared uh, equally between all participants and the idea was that each, each partner would supply computer time and uh, computer equipment and also the necessary manpower. So in that sense, it was uh, very similar to the idea that beta later was also taken over by the, by the internet people. And uh, my feeling is that uh, this idea of sharing the resources, sharing also the burdens that came actually from the uh, YASA project. Well, this is the leader, the first leader of the YASA networking project. It was led by Alexander Butrimenko. Yeah, he was, I have to say, he was also uh, for several years my boss, a very, very fine man. He came from the USSR and then he became the first leader of YASA Computer Networking Group uh, that he has led from 1973 until 1980. Well, unfortunately, this is not a good picture of, of Sasha, Sasha, but um, this, is, this is what I was able to get over the internet. Unfortunately, um, he died around uh, the year of 2000, so much too early, and uh, it is really a pity that he could not remember back about these early years uh, of, of Yasa, and for this reason we don't have anything left as a remembrance from, from him. Well, this is the next picture was, you know, I have tried to collect some of the pictures. Obviously, video it was much too early, so I don't have any videos. But I found some picture with the help of the YASA library. So here in the sense, and that was the reason why it was taken, uh, you can see um, YASA, uh, Sasha Butrimenko in the front, so with the glasses. And the other people, and actually what meeting it was, it is very difficult to say. What you can see is that it was certainly not an English-speaking uh, meeting, because English was the, in quotation mark, the mother tongue, the working language of YASA. So this must have been some kind of computer networking conference. But honestly speaking, I don't know where it was. This picture, also by the help of uh, the YASA library, uh, was actually a YASA meeting. So in the middle, you know, in the white, uh, white, 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 white suit, you can see Sasha Butrimenko um, in the meeting. Left home from him, uh, George Danzig, so the Nobel Prize winner. And Gerhard Krömke was uh, left uh, right uh, to, to Sasha, so he was one of the uh, one of the uh, YASA scientists. Because of, of George Danzig and also Sasha Buntrimenko was very much mathematically oriented, uh, this must have been some kind of YASA conference, very, very clearly uh, seen um, uh, with some kind of uh, mathematical uh, type of, of topic. So this was definitely not a computer networking uh, project, but anyway, Yasa Butrimenko was on it, and he actually chaired, apparently chaired this. So the Yasanet 
project, which was called at that time, it started to take shape. Well, so how it started? It started with some practical networking tests in 1974 and, and by um, creating um, a series of experimental connections. The experimental connections really meant what it was experimental, so it was something for a very short duration. So maybe you know they have hired computer networking link for days or for uh, links and then they tried out how it works. One of the early challenges was in general, not only at YASA and not in an international relationship, but also generally with uh, with, with computer networks, that uh, they were. This was a completely new project. Yeah, all the networks, all the computers were large mainframes. You know, and then you could have to the large mainframe maybe to uh, access via uh, terminal access in 1972 onwards. You know, with real time uh, uh, systems and so on. Uh, you could uh, you could really use for the access to the central computer uh, the computer the, the telephone networks the same also with remote joint entry so when on one end you you entered for instance a, a, a card package a paper um, paper um, punch cards and then uh, uh, went into the to the computer the computer processed the project calculated something and then the results were printed on a remote printer. So these were the typical applications, you know, and for all of them, uh, basically at the beginning, um, tests were uh, needed. Nobody knew how the uh, telephone connections were good and for what speed and then would it be operating at all. So what were these computer connections? So, for instance, there was a computer connection for a few days from Yasa to Moscow from uh, Yasa to, to Bratislava, from Yasa to Pisa, from Yasa to Edinburgh, to the university there, and from Yasa to Budapest, so Budapest that was the stacky. Then from Bratislava to Moscow, and from Budapest to Paris, and so on. So as I said, very, very expensive, only for a couple of days, and just to try it out, if the uh, bits were willing to jump from one place to the, uh, to the others. But with the basic idea to put together a joint computer network and then to operate it jointly, so on a full-time basis. And it was with the idea very similar, but then ARPANET and then later Internet did. And actually this was obviously at that point in time not the only, only network in, in Europe uh, which uh, wanted to do that, but there were parallel many or several parallel projects uh, trying to achieve that. Most of these projects were uh, national, but some of them were even international. But this was the only one in the area of science and research and between East and West. There were also other computer uh, network projects uh, which were dedicated, for instance, for uh, the World Meteorological Organization uh, had already a distributed network for exchanging or for collect collecting and exchanging meteorological data. Then CETA, the airline reservation system, already worked at this point in time. So, um, so it was it, it so the beginning uh, the beginning of, of of it was there. So, nevertheless, uh, all with these tests and conferences. The promise, but uh, needed contributions uh, from the national member organization were much less than expected and only partially fulfilled. Well, the reason for, for, for that was very, very simple. Everything, everything which was in connected with computers at that point in time, but as, especially also with, with data uh, communication and with telephone network and so on, it was very, very expensive. Very expensive were the lines, very expensive were the the equipment that you had to link to the to the telephone network in order to make it uh, make it suitable also for computer communication, for instance, the so-called modems, and everything was expected. I remember when I bought some of the project and multi multiplexer, then they went easily to to per piece for for one hundred thousand or cent shilling, yeah, so which is which was a huge amount of, of, of money just for, for one piece of, for one modem.
Well, what was more easier, of course, to draw the networks, to make earlier, early Yasanet design variants. Of course, these designed variants were based on contribution promises. And uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, because it was very, very expensive, uh, from whichever point of view you are saying, and also Yasa money was needed for many other uh, purposes too, these were only paper exercises. So they were never fully implemented, and I will show you a couple of them. So here it is. Now we are in 1975, in March, 1970, March uh, 5. So that was the initial plan to connect the following centers. And this you will find in VP, this working paper 75, 162. So first of all, Yaza, Yaza Luxembourg. It was, of course, one of the destinations or one of the centers. Then the Computer and Automation Institute stuck in Budapest, the Computer Research Center in Bratislava, the Institute of Control Science in Moscow, the Cybernetics Institute in Kiev, Ukraine at that time, was also Soviet Union, the Technical University in Vienna. Technical University in Vienna was basically the center of computer networking in Austria, but of course everything was in a very rudimentary state, so uh, basically research. The target for the completion of the Yasanet network in March 75, it was 76, which was very, very optimistic and it was not, uh, not achieved. And um, some planning schemes of that time I will show you uh, immediately. So this was a possible alternative con configuration for the Yasa network in 75. And uh, they would have worked with modified HDL, uh, HDL ceilings. HDLC was uh, basically um, a part then later on of, of X25. Uh, and um, actually, so they wanted to modify, they, it has several variants of HDLC, and so they wanted to use a special YASA variant of that. So as you can see in this variant, so um, the Technical University, the YASA, uh, were interconnected, Yasa were interconnected to Bratislava, then Bratislava was, was linked then to, to Moscow, then Yasa had a separate network uh, to, to Budapest, and then there was a plan to interconnect Budapest with Bratislava, uh, and so on. So this was one of the variants, and here you can see second variant. In this second variant you can already see some other uh, uh, further phase of this development. So at that point in time you already saw a PDP-1120 as a switching computer between the Technical University and YASA and then all the other computer networking centers. And this PDP-1120, it was never realized, it was already also connected, at least according to the plan, to AIN, and, and Euro, that AIN that was a European uh, uh, computer network at the very beginning, which was, I, I believe, after a few experimental connections that it was also not implemented, but, but I'm not 100 sure. And then, of course, there were also uh, other use, uh, Austrian universities in planning, which later had also connections, of course, Austrian-wide. Uh, so, for instance, the Technical University of Graz, and then the University, the, uh, University of Linz, and so on. And, um, well, so this was the, the, the next, uh, um, next stage. Then, here could, you could see uh, maybe a third phase, you know, in the third phase, then you could see that was already also a link between Budapest and Bratislava in order to to make this connection a little bit mesh-like, yeah, so not only a star uh, network, what was created with the PDP-1120. And then 
from the PDP 1120, it also had a connection to Kiev, and then from Kiev it went to, to Moscow. So actually, Moscow was linked to, to Yaza via two different uh, connections. Well, so this was the uh, next plan, another plan of Yasanet. Of course, the idea was very much uh, similar, uh, reflecting the situation of April 1976. And the source of this document was a Yaza conference, Yaza conference 76. The Yaza conferences were held every four years, and then you have introduced the major plans, what you had for the project. So this was in volume two, page 210. So this was the more a grandiose plan. But of course, this was also not done. The interesting thing was that what we have already seen, you could already see some of the more concrete hosts they wanted to have access to it and to get services from. So this was the squares. So as you could see, for instance, from Budapest, um, you had, uh, there, there was a plan and actually this was really carried out, uh, access to the CDC's uh, uh, 3300 and also to an R20. R20 was a Riyadh computer, so this was the, uh, one of the computer systems of the socialist countries. So uh, if, if I go uh, back, then in the Via, Vienna, uh, Luxembourg area, at Vienna certainly the CDC Cyber 74 of the Technical University, and that was actually then also later on implemented, so this actually worked. And it was linked to the PDP 1140. 1120 was already upgraded. And that 1140, as you can see, these are triangles. And the triangle means network nodes. And, um, and then that uh, um, PDP 1140 was linked to the internal YASA computer. The internal YASA computer, which was running Unix, I will tell about it a little bit later. And that was a PDP 1145. Also, at that point in time, it already appeared that the computer connection to the PISA computer center, Knutsche, it was Knutsche, I think it was Knutsche, so that was a research computer in Italy, and there was a large IBM uh, 370 168. So that was an IBM, large IBM mainframe, which was much bigger than the YASA computer. So if I remember correctly, some of the energy models were running on that computer, and we practically went through uh, our connection uh, there with a, with a remote job entry and then the results, we got it back. Uh, the next uh, um, point, as you can see, uh, in direction of Czechoslovakia, it was not Bratislava, but it was already Prague. And um, it was planned that there would be somewhere, it is not clear where, a PDP, another PDP 1140, so for, for switching. Uh, which would be linked to the other nation, Eastern National Member Organization, to East Berlin, Not, nothing happened with that. Yeah? The same was also to Poland, which would, uh, they wanted to link to some kind of academic networks in Poland, via, in, via a Warsaw node, and in Warsaw there was a singer, a singer that must have been a very, very small computer, I remember. And uh, that, but that should have been some kind of uh, node in, a, in a, a Polish network. I don't know if it existed, ever existed or not. And then in Poland, not in Poland, but in the Russia, there was another uh, PDP. It was a PDP 1120 linked to an ICL, ICL 4 per 70 and a Siemens 4004. Uh, computer, so these were already large mainframes, and also an M400. The M400, it was, if I believe, uh, if if I remember, it was a Soviet-made uh, computer. And um, um, in Bratislava, sorry, in Bratislava uh, link, you still can see it. Sorry, and there was a Nord 20 computer. It was a Norwegian one as a node, and a Siemens 4004 was linked uh, linked there. And then they had a connection to another node in Kiev, and uh, which had a Mir 3. The Mir 3 was also one of the old Soviet uh, computers. And actually, that link uh, went then to, to Moscow. So the Budapest links, on the Budapest link, you see an interesting node. And that was interesting node was a PDP, uh, a PDP 70. 
And from that north, it was the plan that it would be linked to the north went in Bratislava. Then the node in Budapest would still serve the CDC 3100 and the R20, and then it would go uh, to, to Sofia. So those were the national member organization of YAS in 1976, the eastern one, and so it was rather important from political point of view to show such kind of grandiose uh, plans. Unfortunately, again, too expensive and so on, so this remained, everything remains, uh, remained on paper. So, what were the basic um, principles at that time? The basic principles were uh, that all needed resources would come from the participating member uh, countries and it would be shared. So, the ICT hardware and software with some common specification like HDSL-like links and, but it was not yet a formal uh, like CCITT standard. So, um, it was it was uh, something which was before standardization and also to the ITUT uh, we didn't talk yeah? in the ITUT and CCITT standardization work already began but somehow the scientific work and the CCITT uh, standardization work well those were um, uh, interconnected. Um, furthermore, the computer lines, the telecom costs, which were enormous, you know, would have been also shared. And then uh, what have been very important and interesting uh, for YASA that it would be uh, several shared applications on different hosts that would be offered to uh, both to, to YASA uh, researcher but also to cooperating researcher of other countries. So that was basically the idea. And what was very important behind it that the YASA community in quotation mark and the YASA community building uh, was an important goal and it was of course needed in order to get such kind of project uh, um, running. And as I mentioned to you, similar sharing principle was later more successful, successfully applied when building the internet. But of course, the course of the internet, first it was inter-American and then uh, they have applied this principle much later in the early 90s when the technology was already much, much further and uh, so the, the receiving, receiving uh, uh, willingness and also the cost was much more down. That was, well, that was more than 15 years later than what we are talking here about. So what, was the, what were the problems in implementation of the YASA serve? So YASA itself had very limited own financial resources. As you can imagine, 200 people, they had to bring the people in, the uh, scientists from, from 16 different countries, they relocated to Austria, they had uh, reasonably good salaries and so on, and they had to spend also the money on other projects, so not only the YASA network, but the YASA network in itself, if it was uh, realized, you know, I mean, they would have uh, taking a lot of the money. So YASA didn't have that money. So, uh, of course, yeah, so uh, during these conferences, you know, uh, uh, voluntary contributions were made. So the YASA national member organization have signed up with contribution, but this not, they didn't come in as expected. And also the YASA community was too small. So promises were there, yes, but uh, unfortunately the expensive network not yet. So uh, this physical availability and the high cost of computer lines and equipment and then service instead the whole thing created a serious uh, uh, barriers. And at that point in time, of course, as I said, there were uh, various different uh, networks and, and research projects for computer networking. And the competition from there, from those experimental networks, that were, those were huge and also money needed for, for them. So we were in competition also in terms of manpower, terms of, of resources and so on. And last but not least, the political environment of YASA, it was better than nothing at the middle of the 60s, uh, 70s, you know. Uh, it was the end of the Vietnam War, war and, and uh, there was the detente and so on. The political network was much, much better than before but it was still not supportive. 
So there were still uh, east-west political tension, even north-south tension, and there were uh, including uh, technology policy and technology transfer issues, etc., etc. So the NATO, uh, the NATO has the so-called COCOM list, and anything which was on the COCOM list uh, could not be delivered and purchased uh, by the Eastern European countries, and, and so on. So it was not really a free, free flow of technologies and everybody was jealous of, of each other. Not an easy time. Well, uh, this is basically me. So you can see the different. It was a build, uh, it was a picture uh, that was taken in the 1970s, so exactly in the year when I went to, to Yaza. So this was in 1978. And then this page basically describes all my um, history before and, uh, and until, um, until I went uh, and worked with, with Yaza. So basically I was born in Budapest. I learned at the Technical University of Budapest and I finished the Technical uh, University in Electroengineering in 1970 and then I also made there my PhD, which I have completed in 1974. So I joined then, when I finished in 1970, first the Computer Laboratory for the Institute of Coordination of Computer Techniques, SKI, which was at that point in time one of the leading computer in the research institute uh, of, of Hungary. So my special interest there was, uh, well, I went through hardware, maintenance, and then also software with system software and so on. And then from 74 to 77, I participated in a number of joint projects with Siemens, in Siemens in Munich, Germany, and then between 78 and 1984, I worked at YASA, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. So first I worked in the Secretariat, so which was a management body of the Institute, and then as a scientist in the Computer Science Group, and, and then also, of the, also in the Systems and Decision Sciences area, that was where the Computer Science Group belonged to, and then later on in the so-called Management and Technology area. So this is my prehistory. Uh, at, at Yasa, what I did there. So the history of Yasanet and the Yasa Gateway. So this was basically about the first permanent computer connections for science and research between East and West. So this was during and after the Cold War era. But <clears throat> what is important that this was 10 plus years before the Internet. Well, this is the pictures of the International Institute for Applied System Analysis, YASA, in Schloss Luxemburg, in Austria. So this was a famous, one of the famous castles of the Habsburgs. So actually it was, as I said, the Habsburg castle. And this shows uh, the place of this International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, which was moved there in the early 1970s, after it was inaugurated and founded uh, by Eastern and by Western powers, especially the United States of America and the Soviet Union. But also Eastern European countries have joined, and uh, Western European, uh, Canada, England, etc. The outline of this talk, well, first of all, this will be not a short project on our outline, so I would like to talk about the project course of the YASANET. Then I would like to go a little bit more in detail what I thought at that time, and then how uh, this YASANET project became the YASA Gateway project in 
1978. And that was an absolutely crucial time when finally the project took um, an interesting new direction, but it is very important. And of course, then some history, some organizational aspects of the Yasa Gateway project, and then what were the IC ICT applications, um, and, uh, which went hand in hand with other Yasa related studies. Then, of course, if you do transport at laser flows, as this uh, Yasa Gateway was all about, then you immediately find some political aspects that had to be somehow solved or have to be met with. And then also the starting of the transport and data flow studies. This was all at the beginning of the 80s uh, at Yasa. And last but not least, I made a comparison between the internet and the Yasa net and the Yasa gateway. Of course, these were two completely different animals, but it is interesting to see what Yasa gateway, Yasa net was and what Yasa and Yasa it was not, and the internet, everybody knows the internet, so this is always a good uh, comparison, comparison possibility. Well, and then afterwards, then of course, then some summary and then some lesson learned. So what happened then? As I said, nothing into that direction. But there was, in quotation marks, a full-speed implementation of something completely, uh, completely different. And now I will talk about this something completely uh, different, or not completely, but it was something else. Well, this something else was the redefinition of the Yasa Net to Yasa Gateway. And this happened in the summer meeting in Luxembourg of 1978. I think it must be in either May or early June when we had this meeting. Unfortunately, I could not find uh, the documentation of this meeting, but this was absolutely essential. Uh, what happened at this meeting? So at this meeting, a key decision uh, was made by the so-called YASA Network Advisory Group. And the people of the network advisory group were really top networking people from East and West. And they were very, very nice, very realistic and so on. So these people have realized that this YASA net didn't lead uh, to that target what it honestly wanted to be. And uh, much more realistically said, do you know what? Now we have also other networks which are being into being, which are... In uh, which are there, uh, what would be maybe more important, try to interlink those existing other links and, and, and maybe to create a gateway. So the gateway means it should be something which is sitting in uh, at Yasa in Luxembourg, but it should be linked to the uh, uh, already coming in commercial network yet, like TimeNet and Telenet, Austria, Mark III network and so on, so on one side, but also we should continue with the experimental network. Yes, at that time had already a, a computer connection to PISA. It had also a, co a, a computer connection and, and, and a fixed one, you know, so all year around, also to the technical university. And then occasional computer connection to the east. So they said, okay, why don't we build out of this uh, yeah, so-called YASA gateway? <coughs> So no YASA dedicated YASA network, but utilizing the existence of other cooperating links, a network in existence and linking via YASA gateway. And a very important uh, new concept was that we should enlarge the YASA community. So it was not only the national member organization of YASA, but anybody who was interested in science and research and was um, maybe closely related to YASA in a sense, for instance, that international organization, UN organization around uh, or in Vienna and around YASA, those also could be utilizing these links to, to, towards the East and West. And uh, even some commercial database vendors, if they were working in the area of science and technology. So we have enlarged uh, the, the principle, and this was uh, also something, you know, which is uh, coming up also in the, when the internet was commercialized in the early 90s. 
So share of course the resources remain, but acknowledging that for some commercial resources user had to pay, so we have acknowledged that for some uh, uh, resources users had to pay themselves. So not only for the lines, not only for the computers, but for instance, if somebody wanted to go, uh, I don't know, to commercial database uh, services, for instance, like chemical abstract database, so this was one of those, then uh, obviously it must have been also existing uh, an, an agreement uh, between the two endpoints and, and then of course the two endpoints, the supplier and then the customer had to deal with each other uh, directly and not, uh, not via EASA. So that was, that was very clearly uh, recognized. And um, what was important, because uh, at that point in time, all the networks and links were uh, different depending what kind of standards and what kind of project they did follow. So the gateway had to do, from the technical point of view, a network adaptation, protocol conversion, then adaption of the interface uh, and so on. So that was a major technical task in uh, creating and in, in developing the YASA uh, uh, gateway as such. So this was so this was actually the situation when I joined YASA, which was in April 1978. So one of my first uh, uh, first 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 learning yeah in in YASA's uh, computer networking project and so on. It was this famous conference when they have created, uh, decided to change the direction of, of YASA Net to, to the YASA Gateway. And um, it was also very interesting for me to learn, uh, to get to know all these very famous uh, computer networking people. And actually, so some of them, some of the people uh, went to the Internet uh, Hall of Fames and, and they are today extremely uh, well-known figures, but at that time the community was very small, so everybody knew each other uh, uh, quite well by means of, of uh, personal knowledge, but also what they have written in several newspapers, uh, not newspapers, but journals uh, and so on. It was a very, very small world, actually. So, <clears throat> at the beginning, when I joined uh, uh, YASA in April 1978, I worked for the YASA Secretariat, so it was um, uh, actually a management part of the Institute and I started as the assistant uh, to the Secretary of YASA and the uh, Secretary of YASA was uh, Andrei Bikov, a uh, very, very nice and, and man with, with great, great knowledge, so I have learned from, from Andrei um, actually a, a lot and then uh, he had two assistants, Matthew Dixon uh, from UK and then myself. Matthew was also a com computer guy like uh, myself. Uh, one assistant one was from the uh, from the West, yeah, from the UK. The other assistant from the East, from Hungary. And so we have had a great time and we worked together. So I uh, uh, basically represented um, the Secretariat and I did participate with great pleasure in this uh, conference. So, and as such, then I had to be involved, and I was very glad to do that, in the managerial and organization and planning and financial and community building part of, of YASANET, and then later, you know, or immediately later in the YASA gateway. So I did it, or, well, the other way around. So it was, of course, Sasha Butrimenko was, was in charge of, of this, and I did it with, with him. And then the supervisor, it was Peter de Janoshi. And Peter de Janoshi was, was had two functions at YASA at that point in time. He came from the Ford uh, Foundation in the US as an advisor to the director, Roger Le Levian. But at the same time, uh, it was a short period when the uh, system and decision sciences area had no, no leader when um, uh, Roger has asked Peter to take over also the chairmanship and then the uh, Sasha Butrimenko and his computer science group, it belonged to the system and decision scientists, so I had to deal with Peter. He was also an excellent boss and very, uh, very, very pragmatic and he was very much concerned about different things around the YASA networking. 
uh, especially the cost. So he was uh, amazed, you know, that we had to pay uh, one million uh, um, Austrian shillings for per year for the uh, Pisa line uh, and so on. And, and so that was that came out from the Yaza budget. And then he was uh, really not in front of this. And then, of course, the other aspects were this technology uh, transfer uh, criticism, which was, in my point of view, at that point in time, definitely not true. It was everything was in such an infancy and early uh, research phase, you know, everybody contributed his own stuff. So in my opinion, that was exaggerated. So later on, in 19, from 1979, because I mean, this uh, word also became uh, much bigger than we uh, we thought, and also I had a very clear preference to move into that direction, to be honest. So I was shared with the SDS area and then to helping out uh, Peter in that sense, and Peter and Butrimenko, they did not come along uh, too well. Also, both of them were very nice men, but you know, one from the US, the other one from the Soviet Union in a, a sensitive area. So I, I very, very often I had the feeling, you know, that I was the, the, the translator, you know, the mediator between, between the two. So I started to work uh, with the SDS area and then uh, later in 1981, which was much later, then uh, I was, uh, I left actually then at that time the secretariat and I was shared between the SDS area and the management and technology area. And in the management and technology area, they started to uh, to, to work on a new uh, typical YASA stuff, which was very, very good and interdisciplinary ICT related studies. So ICT and uh, I don't know, energy consumption, ICT and and impact on 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 uh, tr on transport ICT impact on 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 mail systems and uh, communications those type of things and I love to work on those on those issues and also at that time um, uh, many uh, influences from came from the French telematic program and from from Belgian text from video text and so on so it was really a forerunner period for the World Wide Web. And so I was very glad to move there and to make some studies. So those were um, typically YASA type of interdisciplinary studies, but now on new ICT technologies. So later on, when I left the SDS area and then also the YASA net and the YASA gateway, I fully worked on those type of studies. And then until I, I had my departure from uh, YASA in 1994, uh, when I have uh, finally left. So this was uh, my <clears throat> So the next picture shows the general scheme of the Yaza Gateway as of June 1979. So this is already one year later. And this was a source uh, from Sasha Butrimenko. So Sasha Butrimenko did it uh, in 1979. And then, of course, I mean, this picture, it was, it was publicized at many, many different places. And the interesting thing was about it, that actually this was already implemented. So this shows uh, the famous uh, PISA line on the top. And at that time, we already had also a connection to ESRIN, to ESANET, so European Agency, Infrascati, so those accesses where they have offered at least 15 or 20 commercial database services and with the connections to Austria first of all they wanted to sell services to Austria and then second they also were interested in making connection to Eastern Europe and to sell some of the services to Eastern European well were those services uh, um, uh, sensitive no you know, very uh, well-known typical databases, bibliographical databases were connected like chemical aspect, biosis and so on. So any uh, uh, any embassy or, or, or any company located in a Western country in Italy or in Austria, but especially in Italy could have access to those, uh, those, those uh, uh, commercial databases, but at least for Eastern European relation, you know, the linkage and, and so on, it was definitely a, definitely a, a prototyping uh, type of solution. 
And then we had also a connection to the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, uh, database and computer in Vienna. This was an IBM 370 to uh, 155. And on that database, two UN databases were uh, implemented. And I will tell you about the two databases a little bit later because I have a, several, uh, a separate uh, slide on it. Internally, we had the TPA-70. The TPA-70 started to become what was called the Yaza Gateway. And uh, we also started to have lines, but it were only lines to, to Prague and to, to Moscow. And we started to have uh, also a permanent light to, uh, to another TPA-70 in Budapest. And that was the that was to the CD, to, to Stucky and to the CDC 3300, and then um, also as, as long-term plan to the Hungarian academic network, which in itself, it was also being built up. So it was not a network which already at that point in time existed. So from the TPA 70, which was then the, the gateway, we had a connection to a small van computer. The small van computer, if I remember well, that was mostly used for 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 uh, paper for paper creation, yeah. So it was um, a better typewriter, and then it was linked uh, the computer TPA seventy and also the 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 Wang. It was linked to the PDP eleven seventy. At that time, it was the forty five computer. Uh, it was already upgraded to a, a PDP eleven seventy, and this was already a VEX. So it was in parallel to it. Uh, in parallel to it. And that link, uh, that computer was also linked, uh, had a commercial link to Radio Austria. Radio Austria is not the Austrian radio, but it was um, um, basically a second telecommunication carrier, the international telecommunication carrier of Austria, which then later on was merged, much, much later on. It was merged with the, with the Austrian PTT, and then Radio Austria became part of the Austrian PTT. So these were, this Radio Austria, Radio had its name because it was a Marconi type of uh, Marconi created organizations and basically this organization have have been used over radio uh, telegraphic connections uh, starting from the 1920s. So there was also a Radio Swiss in Bern uh, and so on, which also then became, I think it was, uh, became also part of the Swiss uh, PTT. So that Radio Austria, uh, connection had the had the privilege and had the had the license to be at a TimeNet and Telenet node, so which was a commercial US uh, data carrier. And on that data carrier, uh, one could reach from from Yaza several different hosts, both for scientific computing but also for commercial database uh, access. And we could also reach uh, via that also resources like uh, for teleconferencing and electronic mail, for instance. Then um, the, the technical university at that time uh, had a, a temporary connection uh, with the Cyber, uh, cyber uh, 24. And then there was also a plan that to, 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 to have a connection to an IBM computer in Vienna. But as you can see, that one's one was already in planning. And this was this was this was actually implemented so this was the great news well another picture and actually i mean this is my own picture so i try to make uh, uh ecma not ecma yasa the yasa gateway as a center of work and again it was one year later it was in 1980 so this was the source is, is me and I have published in different paper in 1981. And uh, 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 this was actually prepared for the second YASA conference in, in 1980. And so this showed that uh, YASA, the YASA node, the YASA gateway um, in, in Luxembourg, it was uh, linked to North America. Then we had planned to link it to the Euronet network. The Euronet network was the ex experimental network, which was financed by the European Common Market or Communities. I even don't know what it was at that point in time. And we always had ambitions 
to build that link, yeah, but actually it never worked. And the hope uh, to create this connection, of course, uh, completely legally, was the uh, via that the technical university should become a Euronet node in, in Vienna. Also, I have to say that uh, while we had good connection to individual uh, European uh, computer institutions like the University of Edinburgh or CICLAD or whatever, uh, uh, but we never had uh, really uh, good um, good political connections, I, I must say, private connections, yes, to the Euronet people and the European, commun uh, com uh, European Common Market or Community people. So for this reason, we never had a very good uh, network connection to the West, but at least this was the Western Europe, but at least this was the, uh, this was the plan. And uh, much better was the link with the, our Italian link. So at that time, you know, so you could see the EIA node in Vienna and the Cyber 74 connection uh, it, it, to the Technical University. So that one worked. Also the ESA, European Space Agency connection to uh, IRS. IRS was the name of the service and this was sitting in Frascati, close to Nord. And from there uh, we wanted to uh, we wanted to have a connection to uh, to 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 Knutje. Knutje was the research institute where earlier on we had the computer connection via Pisa, etc., etc. But as you can see, the the the, the link from from Yasa to Knutje that was that was cancelled. But now we had the link via the Atomic Energy Agency and via Frascati and to Knutje. And that one actually that connection via the Frascati node to to Knutje actually worked. And actually, we wanted to get connection to the other networks, uh, computers in Italy, and they had an RPC, uh, a called RPC network that was also a research uh, network in, in Italy. And uh, but as far as I know, we didn't get really uh, much further to other other nodes. Well, the Eastern European network connection, so that was the Stucky node in Budapest, so that was a rather stable one. And then the other one, it was still in being building, built up, and this connection it uh, still shows a so-called UTZ node. And uh, in Prague, UTZ was the company, and then ISS node, another institution in Moscow. And the idea was to go over Prague and to to Moscow. So these connections were basically built on on time division multiplexing. So uh, that was the YASA node. So with the implementation with the TPA70 and so on, so this was not in this picture yet. And there were also no X25 lines for it and between Budapest and between Luxembourg and so on. So this was the phase before we had the uh, YASA the TPA-70 installed uh, in, in YASA. The database accesses, uh, what we had, and, and we got later on a lot of criticism because of this, because it was really not uh, understood that this was a part of the, of the community building and there was nothing secret about it. So YASA had some of the uh, links to some of the contracts uh, uh, with them, but the, the contractor, it was the YASA library, so it was not for the for any third party traffic. So if I wanted to find a new book or a new paper, then I could go to the YASA library, they helped me to find the papers. Then we found it and we ordered them and after a couple of weeks they arrived, but no third party. But physically, there were, um, there were uh, also several other uh, uh, databases. So, so there were the databases, both for YASA and then also later on for third party. At the beginning, I'm talking now about YASA. So we had uh, a connection to ESA, IRS, as I said, in Frascati. And I should mention here uh, two names. So the director of, of uh, the Frascati, database server, it was Noel Isota, a very nice Englishman, and then Marino Saxida. Marino Saxida, he was an Italian, if I remember correctly. So both of them were directors of the technical information at the European Space Research Organization, extremely cooperative and extremely helpful. So I really remember very well, with great pleasure, on this cooperation. 
The other uh, uh, access to databases, it was to INIS. INIS was the database of the Atomic Energy Agency and then AGRIS of the FAO in Rome. And both were uh, implemented on a IBM computing in Vienna. And here I would like to mention Harald Pryor. And Harald Pryor was also an extremely very, very nice uh, uh, man. And he was actually a former director at, at NASA. And then at NASA, he was in charge, as far as I know, also of the of the information systems and those type of things. So which uh, obviously it was something much, much bigger what we had in in um, in, in, in Europe and in Austria. And he was the director of the Division of Scientific and Technical Information, EIA, and so he was running basically this and Agris. Extremely positive and cooperative uh, fellow. I, I, he was an absolute gentleman. Uh, last but not least, we also had the patent databases of Impadoc in Vienna, and Impadoc was one. Uh, in the, um, it was a patent documentation database, and uh, it still exists today. And it belongs now to the. Uh, this Impadoc belongs to the European Patent Office these days, and they had databases on on um, on patents, basically on European patents, as far as I know. And um, and so they were located in Vienna, and obviously they wanted to uh, provide um, its uh, their services both to Eastern Europe and, and to North America and to Western Europe. So that's the reason why we had connections with them. And last but not least, we had also accessed uh, uh, databases from, from the US. So um, one of the databases, it was Predicast, who was, which was a very early a statistical database. In my personal uh, experience, it was not terribly useful, but at least from there you could get uh, some some interesting some figures, you know, which you could also read in newspapers. But they have basically scanned in the information or typed in the information which they have, have found in different papers, uh, statistical uh, information, and they put it into one single database and uh, etc. So I even don't know, you know, whether this predicast it, uh, still exists today and what it became. Coming back to the databases of the European, um, of not, not Europe, of the UN databases. So here on this picture, you see a very complicated uh, organizational structure, how information was collected and distributed for the INIS database at the, from the INIS International Nuclear Information System. INIS, that was the name of the system, and it was, uh, as I said, it was run in the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna. And uh, if you go uh, into the details of it, then you can see one goal was to collect the information from each of the member countries, of the EIA member countries, about nuclear research, nuclear research in, uh, literature, and then also uh, distribute the results via um, bibliographic databases. And uh, all what we did in, in this connection, we were one part of the, of the project. Obviously, they wanted to do it, uh, not everything online, offline, as they did it for a very, very long time. But we were the first phase of, of, of an experiment when they uh, wanted to make the collection of the information and also the distribution of the information via the YASA Gateway Access. And actually this was one of the experimental and early uses, usages. Uh, obviously YASA was also interested in the in this database itself because we had the energy energy uh, projects and it, the, our energy project, it was very much pro-nuclear focus. So the EIA databases were for us interesting. Also the other one, the FAO database AGRIS was also interesting for our food and agriculture program. So it was a, a typical win-win situation as you could see and, and, um, and uh, it, it was a, a very good thing. So now I'm coming to the uh, to the uh, 
to the TPA-70 computer as YASA node or YASA gateways and about the first phase of its development. So you could see uh, earlier on what the uses were already and how we used it and now you see the hardware and the software. So at the very beginning in the first phase the following host lines were connected to the TPA-70 in that phase. So first of all the connection to the PDP-1170 in-house computer at YASA with 1200 baud. Baud is the change of state so you could run if the state uh, allowed for instance the coding of 4-bit information then it was faster but it was uh, very often uh, 1200 bit per second. Then the TimeNet Telenet network node in Vienna, so this was also a 1200 baud uh, connection, so it was it was slow, but not that slow. The slowest were the 300. The EIA database center in Vienna, it could be only reached by 300 baud, that was really slow. The ESA database center in Frascati, in Italy, also 300 baud, very, very slow. But these were te uh, textual databases, so even if it was slow enough, you know, you could get the information, but nothing more. And then uh, the IBM 370, 115 time-sharing computer in Pisa, 300 volt. My God, yeah, that must have been a very, very slow connection, but this is what we, uh, what we had. So, uh, of course, so with 300 volt, we are on time-sharing. Well, I don't know, certainly not for editing uh, big programs, maybe for starting programs and then, yeah, letting print out the result locally and then send it via post. I don't know. Uh, the terminal lines that the TPA-70 had, there was a local terminal one line with 900-600 baud, there was also another local terminal which was connected to the TPA-70 which was slower, 1200 baud, and there was also a terminal linked in Budapest and then the link in Hungary, it was via the TPA-70, and that was a 300 board. And of course, via the terminals, you could go, uh, you could go to all the host hosts that were uh, put uh, on the above links. Yeah? But for instance, with the terminal in Budapest, if that didn't matter, you know, whether the connection from Yasa it was a 1,200 bit, it was still at the user at only 300 board. So. <clears throat> Continuing the uh, so history of the early stages of the TPA-70 node uh, development was the first configuration of the TPA-70 was installed in Yaza. Now this is the timeline in December 1978. Then in February 1979, a two-day demonstration was organized in Budapest to the computers and network connections available through the YASA node in, in Luxembourg. So there we try to to publicize, you know, what kind of marvelous services we could offer via these networks and also vice, uh, vice versa. <clears throat> it was rather difficult, to be honest, at this point in time to convince computer users what the advantages of computer networking connections were. What were the ad advantages? Well, if you didn't have a, a strong enough local and fast enough local computer, then you went to this remote location. This was one of the usages. The second usage, if you didn't have the access to those resources like databases, of course, yeah, then there was no other means than to get via the YASA gateway. But so this for two days uh, demonstration, if I remember, it was uh, extremely, uh, extremely uh, uh, successful. Then, uh, during the period of October 79 and May 1980, the node was brought to its second stage of development. And then we have started with the regular experimental service in July 1980s, and since then the node had been daily operation. So, in other words, <coughs> um, uh, there, was, uh, there was the development, you know, so uh, Albert Labadi, and about Albert Labadi I will talk to you, uh, immediately, um, uh, he did the implementation, and he did the implementation of the connections between the between the terminal and the and the switching and the interface uh, access and those type of things. And then later on in the second phase with the X25 
type of connection. And of course, it was a huge amount of of implementation work. Nobody did that. We didn't have the program available from anybody else, and that had to be implemented. And so the program was uh, um, good enough and strong point of view that like, we could start the service in 1980. And then since then onwards, uh, until the end, until the early 90s, we had a constant and daily operation. So it was very stable. So the first permanent regular remote user of the node, it has been the Hungarian national member organization, YASA, with the 300 boat uh, uh, terminal. After this, um, especially after the, the, the successful organization of the demos in Budapest, and I have organized that people who wanted to work with YASA and people who wanted to work with the Atomic Energy Agency and so on, they came to a certain, to a certain terminal in, in Budapest, which was located at Stucky, and then they started to work, and that was actually a, a constant, um, but slow speed working. And <clears throat> then, of course, also the second uh, second line uh, started to be built up. So in June and October 1980, then a lease line or another lease line was established temporarily between YASA and the Institute of System Studies in Mo Moscow for one week each, again for demonstration purposes. And it was a hardware multiplex line and one of its uh, channels was connected to the node. So appro approximately 20 hours of connection time uh, was used to access computer available through the node. So if you remember, one week, seven days, so approximately three hours per day. So it was really only, not really for a heavy usage, something it was more um, showing a demonstration what it could be, it could be done if we had a permanent connections. And <clears throat> then in 1980, we had then during the second YASA conference, 1980, the Budapest uh, line was used to access the CDC 3300 and the computer at the computer cent uh, center of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. I think it, uh, the, and then the Siemens, uh, the Siemens 7, 7755 at the Institute of Coordination of Computer Technics, Stucky. So that was my own institution actually. And I was um, I was glad that yeah, they could make these connections, and we at, at least we had also some contacts with them. But I have to say, the networking uh, people and the networking group it was at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences they were much stronger than our networking people at the Institute for Coordination and Computer Techniques uh, uh, SKI. So here, now I will talk uh, to the early stages of the TPA-70 node uh, development and um, basically the capabilities of the node uh, had to be further increased. So in 1981, in January, so for the second connections and, and also for other things, so five more asynch asynchronous line interfaces had been adapted to, the satis to satisfy the growing demand. In March, March 1981, the system was upgraded uh, by uh, direct memory access DMA ports and bit stuffing interfaces of hardware to provide a higher throughput and to create the possibility of accessing X25 type of networks. So basically with the updated hardware, it became much, much faster and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Albert, Albert Labody could start the X25 uh, uh, implementation of the of the standard. So the new version of the node, uh, so he has created a new version of the node, so included procedures to provide access according to recommendation CCITT X25 and then PED. The PED is it, the terminal access. And uh, the X25 interface was also, uh, the PED interface was used still to, to handle terminals, remote terminals. And the X25 interface, it was used also, was um, primarily used to connect remote concentrators and con uh, connections. So in Budapest, at the first uh, quarter of 1981, a similar TPA-70 port uh, put into operation. So basically with the same software, it was duplicated to Budapest. And then it concentrated 
the Hungarian terminals and host uh, to the YASA node, node via X25. And it was aimed to provide access also to the Hungarian academic network later, when the Hungarian academic network became operational. Um, well, I mean, I remember that we, we had access to these uh, two computers in Budapest, but, but I don't remember, you know, the phase when we also had access to the network itself and, for instance, to have a connection to Szeged or to Debrecen. The Budapest TPA-70 uh, was uh, uh, foreseen to receive communication lines from other countries too. That was the plan from Yugoslavia at that time, from 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 uh, from Soviet Union and so on, from Bulgaria. But honestly speaking, I don't remember that this was ever realized. So the two TPA-70s were connected already then with a 2,400 boat, so it was upgraded, uh, lease line. Uh, using an X25 uh, CCITT protocol. And actually, now later on working with CCITT, uh, this was a very early uh, implementation of CCITT X25, and it was a very good implementation. We, we gave, I remember, a lot of feedback to CCITT and to the ITU when we didn't understand how to implement exactly X25. We, that was basically Albert in one person, and it was, of course, not me. So, <clears throat> on the next one is a link of the uh, in, of the YASA gateway in March 1981, how it looks like, not link, yeah? how the YASA gateway, the configuration of YASA gateway looked in 1981. And this was in CP, collaborative paper 81 and 12. And um, it shows you a combination of multiplexer, especially into the direction of Vienna, direction of Frascati and so on, so that was completely unchanged. It was Rakal Milko equipment and also the modems were Rakal Milko uh, modems and it, was, it worked um, without interruption and extremely, uh, extremely reliably. And um, um, it, it also shows the, the, the connection to Prague and also to, uh, to, to, to Moscow at the UTZ center in Prague, and then um, the yeah, uh, multiplexing line also to Moscow. In Moscow, there was a, a North 50 uh, computer, uh, which was a Norwegian computer, and I, I think uh, one of the main reasons why they have the Norwegian computer, they wanted to have a Western-made computer, and um, probably it was only the Norwegian uh, can't uh, government, you know, that uh, has allowed to, to bring in this small computer, but it was not a big computer. And then we had the computer at the YASA gateway with the, the TC YASA computers, and then the YASA gateway with the TPA-17, then linked to Budapest, etc., then links to, uh, to, uh, to Technical University, and uh, we had the Frascati line, and, and so on, then we all still had the the, the connection plan to, to, to get to, to, to Euronet. Uh, <clears throat> this chart in, uh, in the Yaza Gateway in August 1981, again it was um, it, it created, you know, it, it was done basically my, my, myself, which we have put down into the computer room where the Yaza gateway was, to explain to our, um, our, our, uh, our visitors, you know, how everything would work. And uh, again, the center, it was uh, Luxembourg, and then we had a surfer circle in the Vienna area, and then we had also these remote accesses. So, the new things in these networks were, and again with dotted line, um, um, with dotted line, the first of all, uh, we are Radio Austria, that was not dotted, that was a possibility, uh, that uh, via TimeNet and Telenet, we also could go to North America, they also had already connection to Asia, and to, uh, to, to Australia. These were theoretical connections, I would say, hosts because I do not remember that we ever went to a host in Asia or, or to, to Australia. 
On the other hand, uh, between from Stucky, we had planned to go, and this is dotted line, to the Hungarian PTT network, which was a NEDIX network. The NEDIT network, it was, it was a Japanese uh, network, Nippon and NEC network, and that had a possibility also, not only a modern telephone network, but also for data communication. It was, it has a data network uh, capability, but obviously with very small speeds, only 300 boats or 300 bits in the boats, not bits uh, were allowed. So, the connection to the Ocean PTT network data Excel, as you can see, it was still not implemented, so Euronet was not accessible. This picture uh, showed uh, the further development of this. As you can see, the network uh, network grew, and um, um, from the, the, uh, the automatically the TimeNet uh, um, network, uh, TimeNet and Telenet network, it it got more uh, connections overseas. So this was obviously nothing had to do with us. Uh, so it went to, to Japan, to the Venus network, to the Uninet, it was another US network. Then uh, uh, Telenet, it was split from TimeNet and we had only TimeNet connection. Then in Canada with Datapack uh, and so on. So that grew. And uh, also our, um, our link to, to Radio Austria, uh, it was still with the same connection with the time division multiplexing, but we also had uh, a connection to Radio Swiss and Radio Swiss had Data Star. Data Star was another um, data um, database uh, provider. On so that, you could also have uh, access some some other bibliographical databases. So we could also have access to Switzerland, and if I remember uh, correctly, even to 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 CERN. So this was in 1983. And um, then uh, we could have access then from Radio Austria already to the Data XP network uh, in West Germany, in the uh, Federal Republic of, of Germany. And that was one of the possibility of linking uh, Western Europe uh, to, uh, to, to YASA. And then from Data XP in Germany, you would have a connection to Transpark in France and then to PSS in the UK to the Spanish network and so on to Italian network. So uh, slowly, you know, this PTT telephone networks we, uh, became available and uh, theoretically you could uh, also reach uh, Western, uh, Western Europe. Yeah. But uh, practically, I do not really remember that we have also utilized all these, uh, uh, all these possibilities. So the most utilization, it was really the pioneering access to uh, to to uh, to the Eastern European one. Now, um, interesting link. Uh, what you can also see, and that was also a natural development, was between the Hungarian PTT network, the NEDIX, and then Radio Austria. So then, uh, uh, the NEDIX network, it uh, in 1983, it didn't come for the third-party traffic over uh, over uh, Yasa. It can, they came directly to the to Radio Austria, and of course, and that was the cleanest solution. While uh, the Ocean PTT and also Radio uh, recognized ECMA's role in establishing those type of connection and in uh, the capabilities to uh, uh, the generation of the of the traffic. But it was never thought that the long term traffic it would uh, go through Yasa. And then in 1983, actually, they went already directly. Um, from Hungary to, to Radio Austria. The X25 network uh, from Stucky to the Hungarian academic network in, um, uh, in Hungary, it, it, it already um, uh, worked. And uh, actually, they already had also another network, uh, other connection to a remote computer in Leningrad, so which was um, an academic computer center in, in Leningrad. So as you could see, this uh, major computer connection and the major, major gateway of, of Yaza, it actually grew and it was, it was a, a functioning computer network, already uh, quite well developed in, in 1980s.
The next picture, it is actually only very, very short. I do not want to go into the detail. It is from a paper from Labadi and, and myself about the Yaza TPA 70X25 gateway network, uh, where we have uh, described in, in detail, you know, how the connection work, with what kind of connections we are working and what interfacing and how everything was uh, linked together. So at, uh, this, this shows the communication components of the YASA gateway and of Radio Austria. Uh, um, so in, in Radio Austria node it was in, in Vienna and then of course uh, uh, the YASA gateway that was in Luxembourg. So uh, just so much, so it was it was very well communicated. Uh, the same thing, same thing, yeah, yeah, YASA TPA 70 X25 network. It shows uh, YASA's internal uh, links, you know, how, uh, what, what is links to, to, to it and, uh, and so on. It is, and also to external links uh, to, the, to Hungary and, and to, to Radio Austria and so on. So it is more or less the same, uh, same picture. Uh, we have, well, what is here the interesting information that we it, it was really very important for us uh, to to make it known to, to to inform the world in quotation mark what we did at yasa so nothing was in in secrecy and and so on and we were very proud of it of this uh, of these uh, uh, links and what what we have uh, done both uh, from the technical point, programming point of view but also from the organizational point of view So here, um, so here you can see the main functions, or listed the main function of the TPA70 node in Yaza Luxembourg. So what the, from the software point of view, uh, uh, it could do. Uh, provision of concurrent terminal host communications. So it was, could be done in parallel. User to user communication. So it was possible, for instance, to, to, to write messages to each other user to node operator communication so if you needed some kind of help or such kind of assistant what the explanation was needed the monitoring of the line that was very important because for security reason remote training was also very important because all the users they first of all they didn't know i mean how to make the switches and then how the remote connections work and then we, it turned out very quickly that that uh, albert yes who did also the servicing of the network i mean he had to hold here training courses in quotation mark to the different users. So remote training was an important part. Then uh, obviously saving of the traffic of any terminals, obviously because I mean, for security reasons, we had to, we had to save everything which went through on, of, 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 on, on the gateway, any connections. Authorization control, so for instance, only people who were authorized to go from a certain terminal to a certain host that could do it with an authorization control. Then we had to maintain day-to-day uh, -day file and statistics, how many data went from which node to which terminal and so on, and, and create and print out status report. So it was, it was uh, very uh, uh, sophisticated already in the end, and it did function extremely well. Um, here you can see uh, some of the gateway statistics uh, per month in our of, con of connections. So you could see, for instance, um, uh, well, so you could see that the monthly usage it were it were the, it to the different hosts, you know, to Radaus host, to 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 Pisa host, and so on. So it went up and down depending on the type of the usage that people wanted to use that the uh, over the tpa 17 so if you take into into account yes yeah, so how many hours were used by months to one of the hosts i don't know 30 hours it was not that much and also if you combine all the figures you know so all the data uh, that went through the yasa gateway also in terms of of hours it was not really outstanding but the most important thing was that already it uh, there was there was uh, there was something, and here you can see on the on the horizontal axis actually the number of 
of uh, the, 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 the months of the, of the uses. And depending, uh, for instance, which months of the year was, then you could see it when the holiday per uh, periods was, was. So, for instance, the usage in July, it was much, much lower than uh, in, in May or in, 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 in October, September, October, November. And the same was also true, for instance, in Christmas uh, time, the, the usage, it was, it was very low, so in December. And uh, on the below, you can see uh, to which uh, which node it when the information went to. So you could see uh, the node, for instance, to Stucky IBM computer at that point in time. It was almost as much as to the radio uh, radio Austrian node. It was twice as big as to the ESA computers than. Uh, the internal usage coming to going to the VEX, so for YASA internal purposes, that was rather high uses and access to IAEA databases, it was obviously a very small uh, uses, then <coughs> going to the PDP, <coughs> to the other PDP of YASA, that was also a major use. So from this you could see that the third party use of of uh, of Yaza, it was not that much. The majority of the use, it was for the internal computer or for internal, for external hosts using by Yaza research. But in total, you could see it was, it was still rather inconvenient, and that's the reason why, by the usage hours, it was not that high. But anyway, what it offered, it worked. So that's good. So this is here just another statistics, which we have also published at that point in time yeah, in, in scientific journals. So this shows the monthly traffic of the terminals in Budapest, Moscow and Prague, because that was the, that was the critical part of it, you know, that how many, uh, uh, what was excess from Prague, Budapest and Prague and for, for how long. So first of all, you could see the, the summary uh, of it. Uh, again, you can see it and in, in July it was less than, for instance, in, in October. And the sum of all the terminal accesses, so all of the terminals that accessed uh, the ECMA node, it was, it was 200, 250 hours for a month, yeah, for at the, at, the, at, the, at the end. But it, it, it was growing. And then out of them you could see uh, what was the, the access to a different node. For instance, to Radio Austria, so that was very clearly a database accesses. It was still uh, rather high. And what was the access to ESA? What was the access to the internal uh, uh, to the internal computers uh, and, and so on? So this has been, as I said, in total it was not much, but it is it is an interesting uh, interesting picture. Uh, this and this is, I think, the last uh, statistical picture. Uh, this is the full traffic of the TPA seventy node, and uh, it was for the years in nineteen eighty, then eighty one, eighty two, and so on. So you can see that both time and the volume, obviously, as it became more popular, it then it went up. But in total, both the time and also both the volume. If we look at today's uh, what we have on the internet. Uh, this is uh, very, very early rudimentary. And all the information, the type of information, it is textual information that went on. And ob obviously, uh, textual information was also when, when a program was uh, written and then submitted to a remote host to run it. So this was also published in the same uh, scientific journals at that point in time. Okay, so this is um, Albert, Albert Larvadi at the terminal of the TPA-70 computer, Toyaza Gateway computer. So Albert was the, the person who at the Yasa side uh, uh, made the software for the TPA-70. He was also the one who, who was uh, providing the service of the gateway. And uh, actually, I mean, he had uh, several friends and colleagues at Stucky in Budapest and so they did uh, together this this uh, project 
for providing the TPA70 with the appropriate uh, software. But obviously, since I was also on the Yasa side, so I mostly saw what uh, Albert did in this uh, undertaking. He was an excellent, and he is still an excellent engine and uh, 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 excellent programmer. I think one of the best uh, system programmer that I have ever, uh, ever met. Well, this page, uh, this is John Page uh, and myself at the modem racks of the, in the Yaza computer room, actually in both the modem racks and the Rakal Milgo and the, and the multiplexer uh, racks uh, in the Yaza computer room. Well, um, this picture uh, was just taken in order to show us, also we were also members of the team. John uh, was... Um, a uh, very nice uh, English gentleman. Uh, he was not so much involved in the technical preparation of the gateway and and those type of things, and also not in the organizational matter. But he was the one in the group who had uh, excellent uh, studies. So he did excellent uh, studies that you can also have an access to it maybe at the Yasa computer library about the early computer networking project. And the other one that was that was at that time, that time my myself, and um, well, to, to be honest, yeah, with the multiplexers and with the with the modems, once when they were running, you know, there was really not much work that had to be done. Well, the now the next point is coming. Yeah, the history of the interesting history of the Yaza TP70 gateway of the very concrete computer that became the gateway. And that's really a, a curious story. Well, uh, this is basically me. So you can see the different. It was a build, uh, it was a picture uh, that was taken in the 1970s. So exactly in the year when I went to, to Yasa, so this was in 1978. And then this page basically describes all my um, history before and, uh, and until, um, until I went uh, and worked with, with Yasa. So basically I was born in Budapest, I learned at the Technical University of Budapest, and I finished the Technical uh, University in Electroengineering in 1970, and then I also made uh, my PhD, which I have completed in 1974. So I joined then, when I finished in 1970, first the Computer Laboratory for the Institute of Coordination of Computer Techniques, SKI, which was at that point in time one of the leading computer in the research institute uh, of, of Hungary. So my special interest there was, uh, well, I went through hardware, maintenance, and then also software with system software and so on. And then from 74 to 77, I participated in a number of joint projects with Siemens, in Siemens in Munich, Germany, and then between 78 and 1984, I worked at YASA, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, so first I worked in the Secretariat, so which was a management body of the Institute, and then as a scientist in the Computer Science Group, and, and then also, of the, also in the Systems and Decision Sciences area, that was where the Computer Science Group belonged to, and then later on in the so-called Management and Technology area. So this is my prehistory uh, at, at YASA, what I did there. So the history of YASANET and the YASA Gateway. So this was basically about the first permanent computer connections for science and research between East and West. So this was during and after the Cold War era. But <clears throat> what is important that this was 10 plus years before the Internet.
Well, this is the pictures of the International Institute for Applied System Analysis, IASA, in Schloss Luxemburg in Austria. So this was a famous, one of the famous castles of the Habsburgs. So actually it was, as I said, the Habsburg castle. And this shows uh, the place of this International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, which was moved there in the early 1970s after it was inaugurated and founded uh, by Eastern and by Western powers, especially the United States of America and the Soviet Union. But also Eastern European countries have joined and uh, Western European, uh, Canada, England, etc. The outline of this talk, well, first of all, this will be not a short project or nor a lack, so I would like to talk about the project goals of the YASANET. Then I would like to go a little bit more in detail what I thought at that time, and then how uh, this YASANET project became the YASA Gateway project in 1978. And that was an absolutely crucial time when finally the project took um, an interesting new direction, but it is very important. And of course, then some history, some organizational aspects of the YASA Gateway project, and then what were the IC ICT applications, um, and uh, which went hand, hand in hand with other YASA related studies. Then, of course, if you do transport and laser flows, as this uh, YASA gateway was all about, then you immediately find some political aspects that had to be somehow solved or have to be met with. And then also the starting of the transport and data flow studies. It, this was all at the beginning of the 80s uh, at YASA. And last but not least, I made a um, comparison between the internet and the YASA net and the YASA gateway. Of course, these were two completely different animals, but it is interesting to see what YASA gateway, YASA net was and what YASA and YASA gateway was not. And internet, everybody knows the internet, so this is always a good uh, comparison, comparison possibility. Well, and then afterwards, then of course, then some summary and then some lesson learned. Well, um, the following is the interesting history of the YASA TPS-70 gateway, the computer itself, and uh, it is actually really a curious story. So uh, it, it uh, almost it is like a, a Hollywood film. So let's go into that. So what was this very cu this curious story of the gateway computer? Well, um, it was basically a DEC PDP compatible computer and graphic display, GD71. So at the beginning, the computer, it, was, it, it did drive the graphical display. And the graphical display in itself, it is also a very, very rare animal. I mean, today I really don't see it. Yeah? And it was, it was, I mean, you will see it immediately. Uh, both the computer and the and the display uh, were, uh, were uh, developed and manufactured at KFKI in Hungary. KFKI was the Central Physical Research Institute uh, up into the mountains of of, Buda, of Budapest, and it was uh, developed and, and produced in the uh, in the early 1970s. I mean the the one uh, which we are talking about. Um, and uh, the story of this uh, um, very specific computer was that actually uh, KFKI has sold two of these TPA-70 computers to Control Data Corporation in Minneapolis, USA, at the mid-70s. The idea was that first uh, Control Data should be testing it, whether it is good enough or not good enough, in connection also with the with the graphical display and also to play as a sort of remote job and a remote entry for the big uh, control data computers. And uh, number four, it was also presented 
uh, after uh, the successful test, it was presented in a computer show in Washington DC and about Soviet and Eastern uh, European computing. And that must have happened about 1976. And actually somewhere I have a, a brochure about this, in, maybe in the cellar. And it was very interesting. So honestly speaking, I'm not sure what was the prime goal or maybe it was a dual goal uh, with this purchase and one was certainly that control data was in interesting in buying this, this equipment because as a return of it there was uh, another computer that they wanted to sell to, to Hungary practically in a sort of exchange maybe maybe for 50 percent of the price or something like that. The other one was that control data was one of the US manufacturers who um, uh, very much tried to convince the US government that to make a business in a, a not uh, really sensitive area of ICT technology with the Soviet bloc and also with Hungary, it is not such a bad idea. And they also wanted to show the government that these countries, also they were behind the USA and also Western Europe, but they are not behind, so much behind it, you know, that you cannot even make a, a, a deal with them. So they have presented this uh, uh, TPA-70 computer and actually the interesting uh, interesting uh, story about this was, as, as the control data people told me, that unfortunately they could not convince the, um, the government and the governmental people. So they said that in the report which was then prepared about this uh, computer show, um, it was about the TPA, the, the TPA-70 and the graphical display, but especially the graphical display, that it looks as a nice device, but it is huge, it, which in fact it was huge. And uh, it was so heavy that the false, uh, the false floor collapsed under it. And, uh, and so, so they said, you know, I mean, we, uh, su such a device, you know, where the false floor, false floor collapses, you know, is nothing for us. But actually, the interesting and good quality of the display was proved that after the collapse of the fourth floor, even, the, even then the graphical display continued to work. So the control data people were very much uh, disappointed with the outcome of this uh, computer show. So after that, of course, uh, when, the, when the meeting, not the meeting, when the deal uh, did not come through, with the Hungarian government and also the computer show was over, then the CDC didn't have a further use for these two computers and the business fall apart and they have donated to YASA in 1987 and they shipped it back to Europe to the Luxembourg computer room. And actually they shipped back only one of the uh, donated one uh, to, to YASA and then Albert told me that he has seen the other one. It was it came back also from the US and it uh, went back to, to Vienna. And it was, it was in the CDC uh, headquarters in Vienna. And then uh, he saw this uh, other TPA-70 in the CDC headquarters. They didn't know what to do with it. And uh, he thought, okay, this might be an interesting thing also to get back it for YASA. Uh, because then he could take out some of the spare parts, uh, spare parts and some of the of the cards and this actually it, it, it was the case so the also the other uh, TPA70 computer came back to Yasa and out of the two TPA70 then he uh, only uh, created one TPA70 computer and then that was also then further enhanced with some of the uh, additional cards that was needed to the Yasa uh, gateway. So that's a rather interesting story. Now How did it look like, this TPA-70 computer? Well, I mean, I have taken out this picture from uh, an internet brochure. They, they are quite good uh, presentation about the TPA-70 history, about the TPA-70, about, uh, about the history, about the mo models and so on. You can find it via Google. So this is one of the pictures, but it looked exactly like that. Unfortunately, when I went back a couple of years ago to YASA, in order to trace back where the TPA-70 computer was, unfortunately it was already thrown out. So there is no, uh, no TPA-70 at, at, at YASA anymore, unfortunately.
Well, this is the picture of the graphical display. So GD71 graphical display. As you can see, it was a huge machine. I don't know how many kilos it was. And this was also uh, out of the picture, out of the sales picture. What you could do with it, at least this is what I saw it, uh, together with the TPS70, there were a couple of, of uh, demo programs. And one of the demo programs which was running on it, it was a, a football or a tennis game or whatever. And so when people were very bored in the computer room of Yaza, then Albert allowed them and loaded the program and allowed them to play with the uh, with the with the graphical display and and uh, of course you know this demo program it could do the same thing but also um, I don't know 100 German mark uh, um, PC play of the 70s could do so it was not better but it was also not uh, not worse. Well, this is another. Uh, uh, another um, picture that I have found in the documentation and uh, actually this looks very very much how the original TP70 configuration looked like and it is I have taken it out from the Hungarian sales brochures uh, sources is Lukács Józsa from the TPA history in 2003 it was and and uh, it, it came from the Hungarian uh, science uh, history museum uh, institute very much it looked very much like what, what our machine did also in in the in the middle that was the uh, without on uh, vt uh, vt 340 that was the, the the display the display the console i would say of the tpa 70 so it is very very likely uh, that maybe even even that was the configuration which was uh, which was delivered to the us it's possible I don't know. Now oh, this picture is also very interesting, you know. When I made this preparation and I tried to find the pictures and actually I found I found uh, um, pictures of a visit of the first uh, YASA director, Howard Raifa, in 1978. It was about the same time when I joined uh, myself, uh, I joined YASA. And uh, he was taken around uh, by the, at that time, uh, director Roger Levian, and uh, also the photographer came with them. So where uh, you can see also the, the arrow, the arrow shows actually the entrance, the entrance from the garden, from the park into the Yaza computer room. The Yaza computer room, I was told, was the study group of Emperor Franz Joseph the second maybe two maybe not so here on the picture on the left hand side is the director Howard Raifa on the left hand side is director Roger Levian and then immediately you will see also a next picture well this is the next picture and the interesting thing is that that uh, and this is the only reason why I showed you that uh, they are marching now the two directors are marching now through the computer room, how the computer looked uh, like at that point in time. And uh, you can see exactly on the right hand side, you know, where the arrow is, the GD71 display to them. So this was a situation when um, the TPA70 or the two TPA70s were not put together. So this was the original state. And uh, as I mentioned to you, Actually, YASA didn't have any use, any use neither for the PDP, uh, for the for the TPA70, nor for the GD71 display. Again, another picture that I have found. So the uh, the GD71 graphical display in the upper corner is still there. You know, nothing really happened. The interesting thing is that. There is also now uh, another um, uh, display. The other display was uh, given to us at that time by the um, local Videoton people. Uh, Videoton was a computer manufacturer from factory for Hungary, and so they saw they manufactured small computers, but also uh, also displays, and uh, and they they just came to us and uh, as a public relation activity they have actually then sent us, given us two uh, graphical displays. Of course, with a display, at that point in time, there was nothing what we could do. 
But the plan was that we would link it to the upgraded TPA70 computer, which in fact it was then later on the case. So let us continue with the curious history of the TPA70 computer, which served as a Yasa gateway. So, the, as I said, the Yasa had no use of the TPA70 GD1 graphical display station complex. And except for the occasional demo computer games. So it was very embarrassing. It was embarrassing for me as a Hungarian. It was embarrassing for, for the Hungarian colleague. It was especially embarrassing for the Hungarian NMO, you know, because everybody was laughing. What is now this, this, uh, uh, this uh, ruined computer doing that, doing nothing? And uh, so it was really very, very disappointed. So I told that also to the Hungarian NMO so that we have to do something about it, and this was definitely one of the uh, one of the triggering off components. You know why we have then we, we the Hungarian NMO has then decided, okay, why don't we use then this computer pieces for the uh, for the Yasa gateway, and then I have donated the rest of the uh, of the of the equipment. So the Hungarian NMO has decided to upgrade. Uh, the computer and transform the TPA70 or the two TPA70 to fulfill the requirements of the Yasa gateway. So that was the happy news. And it meant that the GT71 display, which had no use, it was removed from the TPA70 computer. The TPA70 was upgraded and then merged with the other TPA70. And then the very good news was that at that time, <laughs> Uh, we managed that Albert Labadi, who worked at that, uh, at that time still with Stucky in Budapest, and he just who just came for a month uh, to to um, to talk to Andrei Butrymenko and to to take care of this of these uh, computers in order to see in what kind of situation they are state they are. So they uh, joined uh, Yasa for for a long term period, and actually I think he still stayed there for uh, five years long term he developed there uh, the majority of the software and then later on then he has serviced the computer the gateway computer as i said later on he still continued to work part-time for yasa but then he went back to hungary to yasa and actually he was one of the key developers of the hungarian um, hungarian academy computer network which also used the same type of tpa 70s for the for the uh, Hungarian nodes of the of the of the network, and actually that network worked also very well. Both uh, both computers and both uh, nodes work uh, older nodes worked very well until 2000, when it was then taken over by by PTT networks. And actually, at the beginning when the, it was a PTT network, it didn't work as well. At least in Hungary, that's the that's the rumor. Uh, than, uh, than, than the TPA-70 based uh, old network. Well, this picture is about Albert, again, so another picture at the Rheinfalls in Schaffhausen, in Switzerland, in 1982. And uh, actually, I took this picture when we were on the way to Bern, to a UCDIC meeting. Now, UCDIC was also one of the of the uh, supporting group, user group. Yeah, the user group, it was called uh, European Association of Information Services. So basically, uh, database providers, librarians, so users and providers of data, database information uh, were parts of it. And from the YASA side, it was Peter Popper, head of the YASA library, who was uh, on the UCD board. And then uh, he, he was uh, the, the, the one who has brought us to the UCD conference and, and uh, they were all interested, of course, expanding their business and experiment to Eastern Europe. And then uh, we were uh, obviously also very glad to have some, some users of this category on the, on the YASA gateway. So this is when we were at Schaffhausen going to the, to the yearly UCD conferences, uh, usually very nice meetings. Well, then to continue the story of the of the graphical display, so the original TPA 70 or 70s in plural were taken into pieces and upgraded the data communication gateway in 1978 started. But uh, since the GD71 GD graphical display had no, no use, so it was actually picked up 
from the YASA Luxembourg, uh, Luxembourg Computer Center, and it was taken back into a warehouse of the what be, later became in Seged, in, in Seged, what became later part of the Hungarian Computer Museum in Seged. So the GD71 is on display uh, on display now. <laughs> this is how it looked like. I mean, I found it also on the internet in the warehouse of the of the of the at that time future Hungarian Computer Museum. I have to say that now it is very nicely done, and the uh, uh, GD71 display uh, display is on display. So I am very uh, proud of that. And actually, uh, it was uh, Jose Kovács, so, uh, right, who was uh, my earlier boss at SKE, and then myself at YASA, uh, who made it, uh, who, who started to make it happen. Of course, you know, again, it was a major undertaking when the when the small lorry was sent from Hungary. And then picked up the uh, the GT seventy one, which had to go through the customs, etc., etc. And uh, Jose was a main supporter of of, of uh, collecting Hungarian uh, historical computer items or computer items uh, in in Hungary. So not only Hungarian made and, and Russian made, but also also old Siemens four thousand parts, etc. Et he collected everything. But not only that he was a collector, he was also one from the first generation of Hungarian computer pioneers who themselves had worked on the first Hungarian computer. And he was a great guide and a very good friend. And so with his help, uh, found the GT71, it's way to, to second. So uh, as I mentioned, you know, it was not everything uh, everything on the on the Yaza side, so not only uh, Albert Lavadi, I mean, who did all the um, all the development work, but there was an entire team on the TPA seventy side in in Budapest. And uh, actually, since I worked on the on the Yaza side, you know, obviously I knew uh, I knew Albert, and I knew some of the. Uh, some of the management people, so like Peter uh, Peter Bacconi, very very nice and very uh, knowledgeable person, and we are still good friends uh, until today. Then the same Laszlo Chaba, excellent expert, and Peter Darvas. Darvas was, as far as I knew, the other uh, programmer. He worked on the Hungarian side, but obviously uh, without academician. Um, uh, Tibor Vamos, yeah, who is uh, uh, who was at that time the director of of Saki, and uh, actually today uh, he's a, a good, uh, very good friend of mine. Uh, so he um, he really promoted also from the from the managerial and political side uh, all the Yaza cooperation uh, cooperation with, uh, with with Hungary. Well, uh, last but not least, I also have to mention um, Istvan Kish, who was the secretary of the Hungarian NMO, and he worked uh, under, under OMFB, which was basically the state, mini state ministry for, science, for technology and development. And uh, Istvan Kish and then the um, Hungarian YASA secretariat, uh, they did a lot for the promotion of the YASA gateway and also for the Hungarian usage of the YASA gateway. So, his name also should not be forg uh, forgotten. Uh, I, I really would like to mention and give credit to, to all of them and also to many others. And I am sorry if I forgot uh, some other key people, but well, this was all uh, 35 years ago. This slide, I uh, just want to mention that it exists because it is written in Hungarian. But uh, what I, I told also about the history of the of the TPA seventy computer, you know, the uh, what, what the plan was for comp control data that they wanted to buy, uh, according to this article or this this uh, book, uh, one hundred TPA seventy, and that was part of the business. And instead of it, they wanted to give back one of the biggest uh, computers for Hungary. That was the the imagine the not the imagination, that was the plan, according to the rumors. Whether the rumors were actually true, 
I don't know. Anyway, I have only heard this from, from this uh, only source. And, uh, well, the, the Hungarian, uh, those who, who knows, uh, who understand Hungarian, they can read it, but I'm not going to, uh, to translate everything. Thank you. So let me get to the Yasa Gateway. And uh, this was quite interesting also what I found, what uh, the journal Computer Communication wrote about the networking activities of Yasa. It was in 1979. So at that time already uh, the, the Yasa Gateway based on the TPA70, it was being built up. So it, it, it basically existed. So the So the gentleman was Ken Beecham, Beecham uh, who was visited for a couple of days, I really remember quite well, uh, at Yasa, and then in 79 he wrote uh, about this, the, the, the following. A second network link is, be, uh, is the establishment of a dedicated line to Budapest with communication node computers at either end of the line. This project, including live provision and communication equipment, is being funded by the Hungarian authorities and directed by Peter Bakonyi, head of the Computing Center of the Compute and Automation Institute of the Academy of Sciences. The nodes are TPA 70, 1025 mini computers designed and built for the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Uh, well, not quite, yeah? so it was KMKI. Yeah? Uh, this computer is said also to represent the first of the series of the TPA70 machines making use of microprocessor development. So this is true. It was not the first TPA70, but the first TPA70, because there were several of them, or many of them, uh, which, which used the microprocessor development, which, which were introduced in, I don't know, 76 or something like that. It is surprising that a choice has been made to develop them a mini computer specifically for this purpose in view of, of the close control of computer development and production in Comecon countries. The TPA70, which appears to be little known outside of Hungary, is a 16-bit parallel logic machine having modular hardware and software, etc. Well, so what uh, uh, Ken uh, Beecham didn't apparently know that this was um, a TPS, uh, this, was, this was a DEC, DEC 11, 7, uh, DEC 11 uh, clone machine. So it was cloned in the sense, you know, that, uh, that uh, they have developed and also they have manufactured based on handbooks of the, of the DEC uh, machines. So it was a completely Hungarian development and also manufacturing and it was not cloned in the side that I, they have <laughs> Uh, bought, I don't know, a couple of machines and taken it apart and then built it exactly the same because they didn't have the same technology, uh, uh, ob obviously. So it was very much what later, in the early 80s, then the Taiwanese did with the Apple II computer and with the IBM compatible computers. But it is, it is actually not a, um, not a bad uh, development. Uh, way of development because there were the, uh, many programs existed for the deck machines and 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 actually it was an ex excellent uh, solution to take this mini computer as a node for computer networks because later on it turned out that also uh, other manufacturers so for instance Siemens and several other manufacturers have taken the deck uh, the deck uh, small computers as, as node because all of them were running Unix systems or, or, or DEX systems and it used to be uh, proved to be really extremely valuable and useful for, for computer networking nodes. So this is what uh, Mr. Bichamp uh, obviously didn't know. So here is what it continu continues. What is continue? Uh, the software development for the Hungarian link also uses HDLC packet switching protocol, which was true, and was produced at the Compute and Automation Institute, also true. It is hoped to replace this software with X25 protocol in 1980, and it really happened, and if so, it will be the first YASA link to carry this protocol. Absolutely true, and, and you know, it is not only that it, it, really, it really happened. And... Um, so, 
Uh, as I already mentioned, so what Mr. Beecham has overlooked, the TPA-70 was a DEC pdp 11 compatible smart computer, and then also later other companies like Siemens ADXP uh, took the same uh, type of computer as the as the node for their packet switching network. And see uh, some of the uh, advertisement in the future reading part at the end of the of the of the presentations. Now the last part, what uh, Mr. Beecham has written, and I have taken it out because this is so interesting and so good. But here also, this matters and others are included in the subject discussed at meetings of the Joint Management Committee. So this was after the Joint Management Committee set up to uh, represent the interest of the national member organization. An agreed brief for YASA uh, for, uh, arising out of this meeting is to facilitate communication and cooperation between the institutes and individuals working on related projects, particularly East and West as well as to improve the climate for political and commercial agreement that will lead to effective East-West networking activity. If this agreement continue to be supported by appropriate funding and access to, to member state databases, then a valuable and interesting networking li link will have been f uh, forged between the scientific communities of Europe. And actually, this is what, what happened. Well, the Funding it was it was modest but it was it was uh, really enough it was it was just enough that the uh, the gateway activities of Yaza and the usage it could uh, continue etc. So it's 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 um, it was it's also a very uh, good journal article in favor of the of the Yaza networking. Well, uh, this is basically me. So you can see the different. It was a build. Uh, it was a picture uh, that was taken in the 1970s. So exactly in the year when I went to to Yasa. So this was in 1978, and then this page basically describes all my um, history before and uh, and until. Um, until I went uh, and worked with, with YASA. So basically I was born in Budapest. I learned at the Technical University of Budapest and I finished the Technical uh, University in Electroengineering in 1970 and then I also made there my PhD, which I have completed in 1974. So I joined then when I finished in 1970, first the computer laboratory for the Institute of Coordination of Computer Techniques, SKI, which was at that point in time one of the leading computer in the research institute uh, of, of Hungary. So my special interest there was, uh, well, I went through hardware and maintenance and then also software with system software and so on. And then from 74 to 77, I participated in a number of joint projects with Siemens in Siemens in Munich, Germany. And then between 78 and 1984, I worked at YASA, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. So first I worked in the Secretariat, so which was a management body of the Institute. And then as a scientist in the Computer Science Group and, and then also of the also in the systems and decision sciences area that was where the computer science group uh, belonged to and then later on in the so-called management and technology area. So this is my prehistory uh, at, at YASA, what I did there. So the history of YASANET and the YASA Gateway. So this was basically about the first permanent computer connections for science and research between East and West. So this was during and after the Cold War era. But <clears throat> what is important that this was 10 plus years before the Internet.
Well, this is the pictures of the International Institute for Applied System Analysis, IASA, in Schloss Luxemburg in Austria. So this was a famous, one of the famous castles of the Habsburgs. So actually it was, as I said, the Habsburg castle. And this shows uh, the place of this International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, which was moved there in the early 1970s, after it was inaugurated and founded uh, by Eastern and by Western powers, especially the United States of America and the Soviet Union. But also Eastern European countries have joined and uh, Western European, uh, Canada, England, etc. The outline of this talk, well, first of all, this will be not a short project or nor I like, so I would like to talk about the project course of the YASANET. Then I would like to go a little bit more in detail what I thought at that time, and then how uh, this YASANET project became the YASA Gateway project in 1978. And that was an absolutely crucial time when finally the project took um, an interesting new direction, but it is very important. And of course, then some history, some organizational aspects of the YASA Gateway project, and then what were the IC ICT application, um, and, uh, which went hand in hand with other YASA related studies. Then, of course, if you do transporter laser flows, as this uh, YASA gateway was all about, then you immediately find some political aspects that had to be somehow solved or have to be met with. And then also the starting of the transporter data flow studies. It, it, this was all at the beginning of the 80s uh, at YASA. And last but not least, I made a um, comparison between the Internet and the YASA-Net and the YASA Gateway. Of course, these were two completely different animals, but it is interesting to see what YASA Gateway, YASA-Net was and what YASA and YASA Gateway was not. And the Internet, everybody knows the Internet, so this is always a good uh, comparison, comparison possibility. Well, and then afterwards, then of course, then some summary and then some lesson learned. So, something about the YASA internal computers, of course, so it was two words, as, as uh, well, as I should mention. So, this picture um, is, again, thanks to the YASA library, it shows here the internal YASA computers uh, in 1978. So, it was, actually, it was uh, PDP-1170, and then later on, it, it also had a uh, VAX 11780. I think in this situation already the VAX 780, it was already there, yes, on the right hand side. On the left hand side, the PDP 1170, which was earlier on a PDP 1141. And in the very, very back, <clears throat> you can see the TPA 70 in the center back. So then that was already the upgraded TPA 70, which was working as a YASA uh, gateway. This is another view of the internal YASA computer. So you can see the PDP-1170 on the right hand side. Then a very nice uh, lady, yes, who was, who was operating, operator, operating the computer. And the VAX-117080, so which was bought later, on the, le on the, on the left. This was a typical picture at that time from the YASA Computer Center Terminal Room. So as you could see, uh, people were using the Unix system, not as you can see, but were using the Unix system. So it was a real-time real computer system. Everybody had its own terminal and, and it was always very, uh, very, very busy. So this was a typical working day uh, at the next room, next to the computer room in the, in the uh, central, uh, in the terminal room of, of YASA.
Now this is interesting, the Unix at Yaza. And uh, actually, it is, this is now a German article, and I left it as it is, but I have taken it out, uh, which says a quarter century of Unix, and it was written by Peter Saulus, and it was, uh, it was taken from an ORF, Austrian Radio and Television interview in 2009, uh, November 25. And um, so this was taken out of the interview, was referring to a book of Mr. Salus, A Quarter Century of Unix. And then uh, he mentioned in this interview that the first uh, Unix in installation in continental Europe, uh, it was uh, actually version 5 in, uh, in, in January 1975, which was installed by Jim Curry, who was the head of the computer services at that time of YASA, of, of the International Institute of Applied System Analysis. And he did it at the, at the previous, on the PDP-1145 computer. And, um, uh, and then here the question was whether this information in 1995, when the interview was, was book was made, an interview was whether this was true, and then Mr. Salus has confirmed, yeah, as far as he, he knows, uh, this was done. And then he uh, mentioned also the, the situation. Obviously, at that point in time, there were no computer network, there was no internet. So practically, uh, Jim Curry had to take the, the, the tapes uh, from in his suitcase from California and then make the installation. And the installation was to replace the original PDP uh, PDP systems, which were not unique systems, uh, obviously, and uh, uh, and, uh, and he did only by himself with a couple of, of young guys who helped him basically to run this operation. Uh, I myself, it, I thought, you know, uh, that it was a very dangerous thing to do, but in the end Unix has uh, still survived and Jim Curry is now, I would say, a historical figure in Central Europe because he died, unfortunately, a couple of years ago, because he was really the one, I mean, who has implemented and installed the first Unix in Europe, in Central Europe, not in the UK. Well, accordingly, according was my reaction in, 80, in April 1988, so when I joined uh, uh, Yasa, and uh, then that time Matthew Dixon, so the other assistant to the secretary, uh, uh, came down with me to show the computer room, and then he uh, told me, you know, that uh, there was this PDP 1145, and then later uh, 70, and they were uh, running the Unix operating system, which was a, a free uh, software from AT&T Bell Labs, and then Jim Curry, the head of the Yasa computer services that time, bought that to Yasa and replaced the original DEX system, you know, I, I thought I'd get a heart attack. And uh, that was for me definitely the first time when I have heard about Unix at all. And uh, for me it was just another time-sharing system, because we in Hungary we, we already used at that time the Siemens BS2000 time-sharing system, which was, uh, was and still an excellent system, as far as I know, BS2000 computer systems on Siemens or Fujitsu computer even start, uh, running today. And so for me, um, this was just another uh, time-sharing computer, so it was not that great, but I found it extremely dangerous, you know, that they did the maintenance and the further development by them own, uh, their own, uh, by a sw small group of, of people who were not, uh, uh, not a tech, not a Siemens, not an IBM. And I, I really thought, you know, that this open source type of things, which we did not know that it was open source, that it, um, you know, that it would ever work. And I saw that it was not really uh, terribly uh, professional. And I have expressed several times my doubt about it to Peter Dayanoshi, who was the head of the SDS department, as I said, and then later the director of YASA, you know, that this, in my opinion, it is, you know, we are not really equipment for that, and, and I'm really very surprised that we are doing something like that. I was not right. Well, this is a picture of Jim Curry later, 
and actually in suit and with, with, with ties, which he, I never saw him like that. I saw him just in, in t-shirt and in blue jeans and with a bottle of beer uh, sitting at the computer. And he was a genius. He was one of the genius programmers. Uh, and uh, I can say, you know, it was a very, very uh, a strange guy. It was very difficult to talk to him, but he was a great guy. And so he was the one who brought the, the other guy, he was uh, Bill Goodwin Toby, and Bill Goodwin Toby is a good friend of mine, but he was not, had nothing to do with the computer service. He was just uh, working in the finance de uh, department of Yaza, and also an another great uh, Yaza fellow. Well, so I have to say that we had two groups in the computers computer-related activities of YASA. One was computer services. Computer services were, who were running the PDP and the computer networking, the science group at YASA. And uh, YASA, at, at least at that time, had always these two computer groups and they have com uh, complemented each other. So one was a little bit more scientific than the other one, but the other one, as, as I just told you, also developed, uh, developed Unix. And um, uh, one was, was, was American-owned, in quotation marks, of the Computer Services Group, and the other one, it was led by Soviets, so by Sasha Butrymenko. And as such, it was always between the two groups a sort of rivalry, and uh, there was not much, uh, not much trust, uh, to be honest. But obviously, they had to interwork with each other, because also via the computer networking connections, um, um, one of the applications were going to the YASA computers and running uh, YASA models and those type of things, so they had to work together. So at the beginning, the computer services group was led by Jim Curry, as I mentioned, and then uh, after 1978, Jim Curry was still at YASA and he still uh, did programming on the, and the Unix installation, etc., and also other works for other departments, but then he was replaced by Jim Carp. And Jim Carp was uh, was uh, was uh, less. Uh, he was also a great guy, but he was not the same, uh, not the same type of people uh, guy as 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 Jim Curry was. And he was there uh, maybe only for a couple of years, and then he he went back to the to the United States, and then it was taken over by uh, several other people. And and oh, I have to say, all of them were, were very good guys. Um, what I would like to point out that some of the applications which they made and which they were running, like uh, hosting the telecenter application, which was uh, the first email and conferencing system in Austria, in my opinion, those are really the highlights if I look back today. And uh, because, um, bec because those applications are really a, a computer network typical applications and the, f uh, and the first one uh, in, in Austria. But also access from the YASA terminal to remote computer like the IBM in PISA, uh, that was also typical uh, YASA type of, of application. So the name of the two group, especially the computer networking group, uh, the names kept changing, and uh, because later on, then the, the scientific part it was removed, and it became computer communication services. I remember, and it had then after uh, Alexander Butrymenko has left the group in 1980. Then later, for a short period, uh, uh, Petrenko and Yuri Plotnikov later on took it over, and they were uh, developing and running the external computer connections, the Yasa Gateway. So, especially Petrenko and, and uh, um, Soplotnikov was later the, the, the management and under him worked also uh, Albert uh, Labadi. At that time, I already uh, left uh, to the uh, other scientific department for, uh, for, for uh, YASA. Maybe I had some kind of part-time job for a short time, but then I have completely disappeared. And Petrenko was more... Uh, involved in the line which went them to Prague and to and to and to Moscow, so that was somehow the uh, the the uh, the division of work. 
and there were not really uh, many more people. I mean, I show you immediately that the group we are talking about, it is a very, very small group. So cooperation between the two groups, as I said, it was only as much as needed, and but it was not without uh, some suspicious, both sides were suspicious. Well, this is a picture of Jim Cobb, yeah, a very nice, uh, handsome guy, who was the head of the Yasa Computer Services from 78 until 1980, maybe two. I don't know, ex I didn't know exactly. And he was sitting at the console of the Yasa PDP. And also a guy, you know, who himself did a lot of programming on. Yeah, this one, again German, uh, from the uh, talking about the Austrian Academic Network and from the yearbook of the ACONET, Jahresbericht, Annual Report 2013. And uh, they are basically uh, describing the long connections of the Austrian Academic Networking with, uh, with YASA and uh, about the development of, of Unix that it was done in the mid-70s by by Yaza, and then they are dis, uh, describing the, 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 the situation, so what they have actually programmed on the PDP 1170 as part of the UNIQUE, and they also mentioning uh, some of the names who have written some of the programs. So Eric Alman, and uh, who was uh, the creator of the Senmail program, and then carried out the Yaza's first Senmail implementation in 1981, and then Jim Carp, whom I mentioned, Another Yaza staff member is credited with developing both job control and directory stack in C sharp. So, 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 so they were also remembered even from the Ocean Academic Network side, where, where and this academic network with a much higher speed of connection then took over the dedicated Yaza lines, which went to the Radio Austria and to Western Europe and to North America. But that was uh, after our time, and that was the end of the of the Yaza, of the, this classical Yaza gateway. Well, this was a picture of the Yaza computer networking room 1982. As I mentioned, it was a small group, and then here we were sitting at the Heidegger. So on the very, very left-hand side, only half, the, you can half see him, it was Yuri Plotnikov. Unfortunately, he was a little bit out of the picture. So it was not me who did cut it off. And then the next one, you can see then my, uh, my face, uh, and then you, uh, um, um, uh, Sasha Petrenko, then Albert Lado, Lavadi, then Christine Calder, the, the secretary, and then Peter Pronoy. So this was the group, very, very small one. And then later on, uh, we were joined uh, by, a, uh, by a gentleman from uh, from from the, the Technical University of of uh, Vienna, who was who was basically helping with the con connections of the to the Technical University. He was a very nice guy, and then also uh, to to work on the line uh, which went to to Prague and to 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 Moscow. But Albert was the only one who was in charge of the TPA seventy, and then he was the king of the TPA seventy uh, gateway. Very interesting and typical YASA. So these were basically ICT development, ICT services, but YASA was not the, it was not a computer institute. That was what Peter Janos always told me. It was an interdisciplinary institute. And so that was the strength of YASA. So uh, YASA was, was mixed with, with uh, many disciplines. So. It was uh, out of out of hand in many uh, interdisciplinary uh, the studies of, of the inter, with interdisciplinary uh, discipline. So this was a unique situation, but also an excellent opportunity, because early networking uh, applications like email, computer conferencing, Indonesia distributed research, remote computing, access to databases, technical, economical, even political even, have been first-hand exper experienced, experimented, observed, studied, and researched, and finally they found their way in YASA and other research papers. So this was really 
uh, if I look back one of the uh, one of the advances we did in my opinion excellent studies and at the beginning of 80s uh, and um, in the middle of 80s, then maybe for the 84, 85, then it was completely uh, stopped, unfortunately. And what was the essence about it? That this was uh, about 10 years before the Internet was born. And such applications were absolutely novel and we didn't know. And, and they were completely unexplored. So when Internet came, then the applications were already known and, and actually... Uh, the 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 obvious benefits for this uh, application so they were <laughs> they they were known facts but when we did it we didn't know we didn't know whether for instance email uh, would be a useful tool or it would not be useful would it be possible uh, uh, what would be the advantage of of computer conferencing etc then access to databases what is the uh, advantage of having access to 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 uh, lit literature uh, databases and 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 uh, and those those type of things. So the, those were uh, extremely important uh, side effects of the of the YASA computer networking activities. See the major computer network uh, networking application, and at the time of the YASA gateway, and so these are also. From taking from papers which we have written together with with Al Albert at that point in time, so uh, this is only a summary because uh, many of them I or already mentioned um, earlier on. So scientific one category was scientific and service of scientific uh, time time sharing uh, centers. So service uh, we, we we could have access to these time sharing servers computers. So computer uh, computational services, like Knucha in Italy or Stucky, or uh, or f for for remote use at the Yaza internal computer to the Vex and to the PDP computers. Then the second category is service of database centers, mainly in the field of science and technological information. So database services of DataStar in Switzerland, of ESA of Instaki, of Vinity later on, for YASA, then INIS and AGRIS, uh, of the UN databases, etc. The third category, which was very important, which we have tested out, and it actually it proved to be very useful. And the first one, you know, I think it was not, I think it was in 1978, the first email. Uh, so electronic message sending and computer teleconferencing for write, writing joint manuscript, preparing joint conferences, management of joint project. An email. We have used at the beginning the ISIS system in the US in New Jersey, but then later on we have, we have, I mean, the YASA Computer Center has installed a very similar system which was called Telecenter. Actually, it was a smaller system than the IS system, which was much more sophisticated and, 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 and more complex. But for the basic Things what the telecenter uh, was able to do, it could do it, and it was the first email system also between scientists uh, from east and west to, to to be used. So that's the reason why it is actually a historical a historical fact. And in the last cat category, it was bulk transfer of scientific data from uh, for remote handling. So this is typically, for instance, when we were running from uh, YASA large uh, global energy models, which were partly installed the IBM computer, Knucha in Italy or Stucky, uh, etc. So this was maybe the major categories that we have identified for the usage of the YASA gateway. And and before that, there was a group in the management and technology area, which uh, already tried to see research, okay, research on the methods of international team research, how they could work together. So there was a paper for, by Dobrov, Randolph, Wolfrauch in an YASA research report in 1978, which is a good example for a typical YASA working method. They have also taken out some of the experiences that we have made. I will not uh, go into the details of this one uh, today, it is absolutely obvious, but at that time, it was not really obvious, you know, how with a, a tool like a computer network you could enhance your cooperation in the scientific cooperation. So this was in YASA study number one, I would say. 
Next one, it was a topology graph in 1977, so that was before the Yaza Gateway came into operation, when they, already the same group in MMT, uh, tried to introduce tools. It was not computer conferencing yet, but they called it computer conferencing experiment caps, and this was described by Valery Dashko. Valery was one of the colleagues of Alexander Butrymenko. Um, he... Uh, he went uh, home to, to Russia earlier on, then we have actually started the actual development of the of the Yaza Gateway, but he was involved in the in this planning, which I mentioned to you between 73, I don't know actually when he joined uh, uh, Yaza, I knew when he left. And uh, this is from his, uh, uh, this uh, slide, is uh, um, this picture is, is what, what he has written in uh, in, in, a, in a computer paper. So this was a computer preparation when uh, computer, um, a remote uh, uh, a conferencing experiment using telephone, using telexes and even some, uh, some, some terminal traffic and so on between three con uh, continents. So between USA and uh, the connection there to, to Europe, it was, I think, the Mark III network, and then in Yasa, Luxembourg, and then to Eastern Europe, uh, to, to, to Poland, and to, to Russia, using telexes and telephones, and, and so on. So this was before the computer networking age of Yasa, but, but it's, it's interesting. As I said, email and computer conferencing use was um, a study and the de early development of, of YASA. And um, we have developed our own application installed and used on the internal YASA host for internal remote access. And then later on, uh, follow-up studies were prepared about large-scale application and transporter data flow policy application of the technology. And this was done in the Yaza MMT area, and uh, actually I was one of the authors of these papers, you know, it was basically when we were dealing, uh, we already see the, the impact of the video text, so practically web, -based, web type of, of, of networks and, and internet type of networks and the gro uh, global and large scale usage of these systems and then and, and how it would look like the society when this uh, this usage was uh, was was employed employed uh, on a large scale. So actually, what we have today, I think we have described it extremely well at the, that time in the Yaza MMT group at the early 1980s. Uh, this paper is about the um, working paper about email and teleconferencing uh, at uh, Yaza. So the first step in 1980 and how we have used the ISIS system in New Jersey Institute of Technology. So you can see a login. And actually the email exchange we chose, it was between uh, between Yasa, including myself, and uh, and uh, Mike Pearson, who, who was then later on the, 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 the father of, of the Telecenter computer program, and then Peter Hoshka from GMD. GMD is, is, uh, was in, in near Bonn in, in West Germany. And actually, so we have exchanged emails over the New Jersey Institute of Technology system in New Jersey. So he had a mailbox there, I had a mailbox there, and then we wrote them. We, we wrote some emails. This was the early emails. And it was presented in an early working paper of myself. Well, the main uh, main target, yeah, or, or how it, such a system should look like, and we have honestly speaking learned from this, that was the IS system. And I have to mention it because I, I must give also credit to Murray Turov and then Starox and Hills. So those were the two people who wrote a book and who were running, uh, who were in charge of the IS system. I have met both of them when I started to work at Siemens uh, in standardization. Both Turov and then uh, Star Oksana Hills uh, uh, did standardization at, at ITU in CCITT study group one, which were, was dealing with services. But so we have met each other there, but only for a very, very short time. And this system that we have taken as, which was a classical uh, computer conferencing system, it was 
uh, basically created in 1974, so four uh, years earlier than we have started to work with it. And it was founded by the National Science Foundation. And it was, uh, um, it was really an experimental system where they have learned a lot and we have learned a lot. And it could be accessible by telephone, dial-up, computer networks, and so on. And at the peak, it had more than 2,000 subscribers from everywhere in the world and including YASA. So it was really a, a big system. And YASA accessed this ISIS system via our radio uh, Austrian TimeNet Telenet uh, gateway. And it, it really was good. So the main person at ECMA, not ECMA, at YASA, and I have to give really credit to him, is Michael Persson. And he came up with the idea of a YASA-owned system, and it was a sort of uh, a submarine project, if I may say so, but so he implemented it, in, and then they have introduced it. So it was for discussing uh, YASA manuscripts, transmitting sections of them, integrating text processing and computerized conferencing in the same Unix environment. It is very typical. So today, it is it, there is nothing new. New is that it was the first system between East and West, and also the first system of such uh, in Austria as a whole. All these uh, other Austrian systems they were much much later. So YASA research task explored the general usefulness of computerized conferencing for YASA research team, and especially uh, one of the of these uh, groups was the so-called YASA survey uh, project. And this was also when, when, uh, uh, when the, uh, Mike Pearson and Karin Letrop uh, was, was, was the other, was a lady who had this running. They have written several good papers, which you can uh, still find in the YASA, uh, uh, YASA library. So internal YASA memoranda are there. So Telecenter was the first email and conferencing software by Mike Pearson and Jim Carr, developed in YASA 1981. So this was the YASA owned and installed computer and com system, computer conferencing system. It was called Telecenter. And the, what it could do, the functionality it is, was very similar what you what was on the iSystem and also what you have today on a decent uh, conferencing system and and email system decent well today they are much better of course so you would create conferences add participants remove participants enter new comments modified all comments learn who has seen the comments status of people who participating but uh, first of all you know it was the first international email uh, and conferencing system between used between east and west for scientific purposes especially This one is just an example of the Telecenter user manual from 1981, Karen Letrop and uh, Mike Pearson. Uh, well, this is how, how you could log in and then what was one of the session, typical character oriented uh, communication with all the comments, you could see what were the main comments, comments and well, this is uh, just to prove you know that I'm not telling you rubbish, it was really a lot of documentation behind it, and, and we were the first. This is the other end of the of the YASA papers, which I mentioned. So YASA papers on future RCT trends and impacts of information technology on impact regarding email conferencing on other types of communication forms. So this was the title of the paper video text message service system video text were a video text like system that was our uh, usage of the world it was basically what today is the world wide web consortium so yasa studies have early recognized the trend e.g. via the french telematics program that personal computer inexpensive data networks will significantly influence daily life so this was uh, uh, one uh, such kind of studies, and I think it was a very good study, to be honest, uh, between Wolfrau, uh, Hermann Maurer, and then myself, and it came out in August 1981. 
Uh, here uh, you see the conclusion, what we were thinking about future email and conferencing system and, and actually on the World Wide Web. And I don't want to read it through, but actually I am very proud to say that many of the conclusion or more, in fact, all the conclusion that came through. So, so and this was uh, really, I would say, 15 years before, 15, 20 years before uh, these uh, systems on the World Wide Web became dominant and now everybody is using it. So our, our fo uh, future forecasts and impact studies were actually quite good, I must say. Well, uh, this is basically me. So you can see the different. It was a build, uh, it was a picture uh, that was taken in the 1970s, so exactly in the year when I went to, to Yasa. So this was in 1978. And then this page basically describes all my um, history before and uh, and until um, until I went uh, and worked with Vityasa. So basically I was born in Budapest. I learned at the Technical University of Budapest and I finished the Technical uh, University in Electroengineering in 1970 and then I also made there my PhD which I have completed in 1974. So I joined then, when I finished in 1970, first the computer laboratory for the Institute of Coordination of Computer Techniques, SKI, which was at that point in time one of the leading computer in the research institute uh, of, of Hungary. So my special interest there was, uh, well, I went through hardware, maintenance, and then also software with system software and so on. And then from 74 to 77, I participated in a number of joint projects with Siemens, in Siemens in Munich, Germany, and then between 78 and 1984, I worked at YASA, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, so first I worked in the secretariat, so which was a management body of the institute, and then as a scientist in the computer science group, and and then also of the also in the systems and decision sciences area that was where the computer science group belonged to, and then later on in the so-called management and technology area. So this is my prehistory uh, at at YASA, what I did there. So the history of YASANET and the YASA Gateway. So this was basically about the first permanent computer connections for science and research between East and West. So this was during and after the Cold War era. But <clears throat> what is important that this was 10 plus years before the Internet. Well, this is the pictures of the International Institute for Applied System Analysis, YASA, in Schloss Luxemburg, in Austria. So this was a famous, one of the famous castles of the Habsburgs. So actually it was, as I said, the Habsburg castle. And this shows uh, the place of this International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, which was moved there in the early 1970s, after it was inaugurated and founded uh, by Eastern and by Western powers, especially the United States of America and the Soviet Union. But also Eastern European countries have joined and uh, Western European, uh, Canada, England, etc. The outline of this talk well, first of all, this will be not a short project or nor other. So I would like to talk about the project course of the YASANET. Then I would like to go a little bit more in detail what I thought at that time. And then how uh, this YASANET project became the YASA Gateway project in 1978. 
and that was an absolutely crucial time when finally the project took um, an interesting new direction, but it is very important. And of course, then some history, some organizational aspects of the Yasa Gateway project, and then what were the IC ICT applications, um, and uh, which went hand in hand with other Yasa related studies. Then, of course, if you do transport the laser flows, as this uh, Yasa Gateway was all about, then you immediately find some political aspects that had to be somehow solved or have to be met with. And then also the starting of the transport and data flow studies. It, it, this was all at the beginning of the 80s uh, at Yasa. And last but not least, I made a comparison between it, the internet and the Yasa net and the Yasa gateway. Of course, these were two, two completely different animals, but it is interesting to see what Yasa gateway, Yasa net was and what Yasa and Yasa it was not, and internet, everybody knows the internet, so this is always a good uh, comparison, comparison possibility. Well, and then afterwards, then of course, then some summary and then some lesson learned. Well, uh, this was basically the positive side, and here I could also close my presentation on the Yasa Gateway, but there was also, um, uh, I would say, a um, very interesting part of the Yasa Gateway, and, and it was uh, caused maybe by stormy times, stormy political times, I would say, in the early 1980s. And if you look back what happens in the early 1980s, well, uh, first of all, the Russians or the Soviets have marched in into Afghanistan, which did not contribute extremely positively to the spirit of cooperation between East and West. But then, maybe also as a, re a result of it, and also a result of the crisis that the US had in Iran with the hostages, uh, then Ronald Reagan came into power, and Ronald Reagan, who didn't particularly like the communist party countries, uh, one of the first activities that he did, uh, he cut uh, the, 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 the money and the, the cooperation uh, between East and West, also in the scientific area, and then of course uh, Yaza was one of the early uh, victims. So this is what we have noticed from that. So. One of the argumentation, it was lack of, lack of reciprocity and uh, prompts Yaza cut off. And this appeared in the science, volume uh, 216. It was in April 1982. And this was a moderate news article. Uh, which explained that the Reagan administration had terms thumbed down to continued uh, government funding, American membership of the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis outside of Vienna. And uh, it really went into very high political circles uh, between President Reagan and uh, the Austrian Chancellor Bruno Kreisky. And Bruno Kreisky was very helpful in the creation of of Yaza earlier on, he was the cancer, cancer, uh, chancellor, and um, he uh, wrote even a letter to Reagan that uh, this institute it should be kept and so on, and uh, and the U.S. should continue to support Yaza, which it did not. And um, here this the paper then basically describes so what was the main reason for the American drawback. And there were several arguments used in in this. And one of the argument was that that uh, another official said that the administration, now I'm quoting, has been concerned that Soviet and Eastern European scientists had access to Western databases through Yata computers, and also that Soviet scientists working at the Institute might not be bona fide, uh, fide scientists. And he acknowledged that Yasa had proposed taking measure to deal with this concern, but said the US officials were not persuaded that such measure could be effective. However, no particular issue caused the decision, the decision he said. So this was about the drawback. Now, uh, well, 
so in, in my earlier uh, deliberation, I mentioned, you know, so uh, what was the technology? It was incidentally completely Eastern European technology that we have used for the gateway, at least for the modems, not. We have used Rakal Milgo modems and uh, and also other comp components, but the, the, the heart of the system, it was uh, really uh, Eastern European and we did not have uh, anybody in on the team yeah, who actually came from Western Europe. The access to the computer resources, I have pointed out several times, so there were UN databases, commercial databases, you know, so those were not really uh, sensitive databases and also access to scientific computer centers. So it was, well, so the lack of pre uh, reciprocity, honestly speaking, I did see at that point in time, and I am not seeing it uh, today uh, as I am presenting this. Well, this was here another article, and basically by the Zeit, Zeit Online. Zeit is a German newspaper, and it is actually a very good uh, newspaper and that one uh, writes a little bit uh, also about uh, outside of the computer communication area that also at that time unfortunately uh, Soviet secretary of Yaza so this was after uh, Andrei Bikov uh, has left so the new secretary it was said that he was uh, he was working in some areas you know that he was a spy for the KGB etc etc Anyway, so he uh, also had to leave Austria uh, very, very quickly, and also this was taken as a as a as a prejudgment by the government, Reagan government and presidency, uh, to lose the, the ties between uh, between U.S. and the Soviets on 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 the Asa. So this explains this uh, story in a, uh, very, very briefly. A strange one was this one, but it was done by the, written by the new scientist, so it was a serious paper, which came out on December 1982, so more Cold War uh, type of, of, of observations, you know, what the YASA did, and then one of the, uh, uh, one of the, uh, um, one of the, of the claims were by some of the people that actually Ra Russia did tap. Alder Master's computer. Alder Master was, as far as I know, or as far we, we learned from this article, it was a main um, research or operating site for nuclear research in the United Kingdom. And it was said that the Yaza Gateway was used for that, uh, uh, for that uh, accessing this computer, which was sounded as an extremely good story, but uh, as science wrote, uh, they have investigated whether this was true or not true on the on the on the um, British side, and then it turned out that the Cray One computer was supposed to be tapped uh, via the Yaza gateway. They even didn't have any external connections, which made a lot of sense. And even today, you would not <coughs> you would not put any um, computer of that nature to the internet because of security reasons, and let alone in nineteen nineteen eighty two. This was an extreme one, which uh, I, I I don't want to go into details, but it just uh, uh, just went went to mention how what what the atmosphere was uh, looked like, you know, that the entire Yasa and Yasa activities it was used by the Soviet for technology as a technology stealing machine and uh, uh, loopholes in the Western security. Well, you know, so the institute it was it was definitely much more than and. And uh, it also continued uh, um, regarding the uh, Yaza, uh, chairman of Yaza, against uh, Yermen Kvishiani. So I'm not going into the details of, of that. It was extremely, extremely nasty. This one was the same one. So he was, uh, Kvishiani was the SES committee chairman for science and technology, and he was one of the of the uh, co-founder of Club of Rome and, and uh, uh, son-in-law of, of Alexei, Kol Alexei Kosygin and as such, as such, with such a background and he was a brilliant guy 
actually you know he was uh, uh, definitely one of the linkage fig figure uh, bit in, in those years between east and west in that area and um, but this is also uh, this this was the other side and as such uh, he played an important role in yasa and he was the uh, uh, the chairman of, of, of Yaza for a very, very long time. And he was uh, also uh, had a major part in the creation of the institute itself. Well, what was the response from Yaza side on the level of the Yaza gateway? And um, um, so first of all, I have to I, I have to mention probably I will mention it that uh, the the way how this whole whole allegations uh, were, were treated by the Yasa management uh, it was it was extremely wise and extremely uh, ex extremely positive I would say and uh, also the the way how we internally. Uh, spoke to each other and discussed with each other. Okay, what should be done in order to to uh, to to minimize this type of allegations on one side, but also on the other side, not to encourage anybody, you know, who could come to a, a stupid idea reading these this newspaper articles and and also uh, using their fantasy that Yaza and the links of the of the Yaza computers is really the best tool for accessing um, foreign databases, computers, uh, etc. So from this uh, reason, from the very, very beginning, um, the YASA gateway, so we had an agreement, internal agreement, so we didn't allow, uh, we only allowed a control, so it means not free flow of information. So it was not like the internet at the beginning, you know, free flow of information everywhere to each country and so on, democracy, etc., etc. This was not the case in the case of Yaza. We knew that there were two worlds, the Western world and the Eastern world, and we knew that you had to control the information from the very beginning. And um, in practice, what we saw uh, as traffic, it was mostly, as, you, as I have shown it earlier on, a small amount of character of the data, and we have not used encryption. And everything which went through the Yasa gateway, actually it was printed out immediately on the display and then it went into paper. So all traffic, it was recorded and stored and actually on, on endless paper. Leporello was the paper type, you know. Big, big mountains of papers which we have stored for months and months and then occasionally the management had a occasional look on it and, and also we had a look on it. I mean, uh, Albert had a look on it who was operating the the, the gateway and uh, uh, honestly speaking, so uh, so we didn't recognize uh, any any suspicious activities. Uh, so this was constantly reviewed, as I said, by the operating staff and from time to time by the upper management. Here again, the main usage categories of the of the Yasa gateway. I I do not. about the main usage category of the YASA gateway uh, as a matrix. I do not want to go into that. Um, it goes in a little bit more detail what I have already mentioned to you, who was accepting what. And in order to do that, any connection from anybody to anybody, it had to be authorized. So it was not a free switch like what you have on the internet, you know, uh, only before registration, authorization, you could have um, a very, uh, very, very regulated and very, very um, uh, guided and very um, strict access to the to the resources. So here you can see the Yasa gateway. What kind of control it has? Routing control and traffic mo monitoring functions. So here are the list of those functions. So it was, it basically provided, there was a provision of concurrent terminal host communication. So not only one communication, but many parallel in the same time. It also supported in parallel to it user to user communication. So user A could send a message to user B at the two, uh, two different endpoints. 
then user uh, user to node operator communication, so which was an obvious one. And then we did a monitoring at the node operator side. We did also from the node operator side remote training. Uh, Albert did a lot of this stuff. And then we saved the traffic of all the terminals, of any of the terminals, and then we exercised authorization control. And we have maintained of data files and statistics and status reports and so on. So this was included as a main function of the TPA 70 node um, software. Another side effect, and now this is on the positive side, that we started the dealing also with transborder data flow policy issues and the impact on, on, on everything, on, 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 on uh, communication, on, on economy, on work, uh, labor, etc., etc. And uh, as I said, so YASA would not have been YASA if the observation gained from, from, from this basically gateway function and operational experiences of the YASA gateway, of the YASA transporter data flow traffic, if it didn't enter into interdisciplinary research and study. And so we tried to understand uh, the phenomenon of transborder data flows, and actually we needed part of the, of the transborder data flow community, which at that point in time, it was very, very, uh, very, very small community, but we were part of it. There was a nice uh, transnational data report, was the news, uh, newspaper, we were on the editorial board and so on. So we have pointed out what kind of transborder data flow application will emerge and, and and uh, we pointed out and we, we dealt with privacy, security, vulnerability, big data, analytics type of issues, concept of nets, sovereignty, cyber security, etc. And these are today, today big, big subjects. They were, when we started this at the beginning of, of 80s, they were no subject. The uh, traffic was so minimal that there were no issues. So I remember that we did it for a couple of, the, of, of years, but then at that time, you know, the effect was, uh, was still so little that, that uh, when it was discontinued, then I said, okay, this is now too early. But now, now this is one of the hottest subjects, and if in, on the internet these problems are not going to be solved, and the internet is running uh, really in great, great difficulties. So unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, this research activity had been phased out in the mid-1980s in YASA, but definitely we would need it today. So YASA would definitely be a place today with the interdisciplinary research and with the subject that could really contribute to these uh, discussions. Uh, this is an example of a big data and privacy related study from 1984, so it was rather late. And it was published in the Electronic Publishing Review. Uh, without text, without Big Brother. Without text is basically the World Wide Web, I would say. And this was written by Hermann Maurer and Norbert Rosenich from the Ocean Computer Society. At that time, he also worked at the Ministry, Ocean Ministry for, for Research. Um, Ministry for Wissenschaft und Forschung, and then my, myself, and uh, we are we are uh, discussing in this paper about the about the possibility of the big big brothers, um, about uh, about uh, um, database searching. That if somebody uh, just take the searching question and is is just interesting, what you are interested in in terms of of of, of asking your question from the network then actually a lot of things can be found out about you. And well, after 25 years after, now you see Google, you see uh, Facebook and all the other friends over the internet. And actually uh, uh, we are being faced with these uh, uh, huge data collection activities that we have uh, pointed out at the beginning of, uh, of 1980s yeah, with this uh, uh, study. So we were actually rather, rather close in our uh, uh, forecast what will happen. So what was the grand final? What was the end of the Yasa Gateway? Well, so here the sun is going down 
and I will try to answer it, but actually this is the most difficult part. I have already left Yasa, then Albert uh, did work, but only part-time, and actually when I tried to find out what the end, ex exact end want, then I could not find it out. I can only... So what happened to the Yasa Gateway after the mid-1980s? So surprisingly, uh, little is known and not much data, not much documentation has been found on that. And Albert uh, Lavati and myself, so we really tried to document everything in several reports and papers. But unfortunately, when we have left, all people and who came after us, they did not know do it. So we don't know. So we only know that the TPA-70 Yaza Gateway did operate 24 hours per day, uh, per day, 365 days per year, and at least for 10 years. So we can see it in the book about the TPA-70 history book of Lukács, but we do not exactly when it was taken out from service. So probably around the time when Yaza got directly connected to the Aconet, so it must have been 1987-1988, I guess. And see you on that uh, the next slide. What what I have found. Yaza's link to the Arconet and later to the Internet. And uh, this Yasa's relationship with the Arconet began in 1987, when Yasa switched to an uh, hourly UUCP polling for email transfer from a site in Amsterdam to the Technical University of, of, uh, of Vienna. So this was basically, it came from an Arconet documentation. And this was followed, the same documentation said, by a dedicated IP connection to the Technical University of Vienna, which gradually increased a 64 kilobit connection in 1991. So that was probably an ISDN type of, of, of speed connection to a current rate of 200 megabit per second. So this, this was a paper which is a couple of years old. So it is 200 megabit per second, of course, it is a, it is a very high speed. So this connection is necessary to support the large data transfer required by Yaza scientists and researchers. So today we know that they access, it goes in the, via the Aconet network and at a very high speed. So this is definitely already a, a, a fiber, a fiber a cable type of, of connection. That's all what we know. And uh, Anna, And another found, it was sourced from the OS, uh, ORF, Ocean Radio uh, and Television interview with, with Peter Rastl. And then he is describing, now this is in German, so I have to translate it in English, roughly translated. So 20 years of internet in Austria. And this was published in the Netz History, Netz Geschichte in 2010, May 2010. And then he, he writes that the 10th of August 1990, um, it was um, a st um, fix, a fixed connection uh, was from, 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 the, uh, from Geneva CERN uh, laid down to the uh, University of Vienna and the internet protocol TCP IP uh, was, was, uh, was used on, on, on that uh, uh, link. So that was, that was in 1990. So that was the first TCP, 90, uh, TCP IP implementation in Austria. And uh, from, from this time onwards is Austria permanently uh, connected uh, with the Internet. So it also means that at that time, uh, because YASA was connected already to the Arconet earlier on, then YASA via Switzerland and via, via CERN uh, got uh, direct connections to the, uh, to the, to the Internet. <laughs> Again, not a YASA documentation, unfortunately, but a third party documented. Uh, from the other side, uh, also Peter Bacconi, who was in charge of the 
uh, Hungarian internal development later on and Stucky development first, uh, wrote down, and, and thank you very much, Peter, that at least Peter uh, has, has uh, very nicely described the Hungarian de development, and of course in the Hungarian development always they were mentioning about the YASA, uh, YASA uh, computer networking stuff. So the information network development in Hungary in the 1980s. So in 1986, that was the start of the Information Infrastructure Development Program, IIF program by the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, by UMFB, so which was the science uh, ministry, and uh, OTCA, that was the central funding agency for academy uh, research. And then the next step in 1988, the first phase based on the X25 based network connections, exactly like the YASA gateway like, was then installed. And uh, on that, the first Hungarian developed and hosted email, ELLA was the name of the email. So in 1989, then Hungary joined the X25 uh, via international network connections. So that was probably with DATXP and those type of things. And then in 1991, in the second phase, Hungary joins the internet. And in politically, it was still not an easy situation as Bakony describes it. So that, that was the, uh, the, the uh, uh, very much the same time, also similar time when in Austria uh, joined the internet, maybe one year later. And then in 1992, so this was the third phase of the Hungarian development, uh, that was the development of the Hungarian HBON net. Uh, the HBON was the is was or is the the Hungarian high speed network, and today you have also a, a huge and big uh, Hungarian uh, um, fiber based uh, um, uh, based network to to which the Hungarian internet is 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 connected. So in fact, the YASA work has very much. Um, help them, first of all, to get the know-how. The know-how was the, what they have developed their own, practically. But that's also very, very uh, important. And then the, the project, and the, the, the project that it was there, you know, it helped them to develop, based on this technology, the first Hungarian, serious Hungarian computer network, and then which then became uh, later than uh, the, the Hungarian internet. So these are now the final thoughts. So YASA versus the internet, as I said, it is just to make some kind of, of, of com comparison. The, the two things are not the same. So I'm comparing here a little bit uh, apples to, to oranges or apples to pears, but let's try to do it. So, what are the uh, uh, summary? What is the summary and what are the conclusions of all this? Well, I would say the computer networking and other early computer projects of YASA are certainly important part of the ICT history. And I would say definitely in Austria, uh, definitely in Europe, uh, but maybe even worldwide. And uh, given the advantages, but also the limitation what YASA had, this project was successful, and uh, this is also true if I look back uh, now from the historical perspective. So the combination of ICT service, novel application, followed by an interdisciplinary studies in an inter interdisciplinary research setting, were unique and most successful. And this was provided by YASA. There are also many subjects in the current ICT era like cybersecurity, privacy, ICT risk, uh, internet, sec internet security, internet economics, and so on, where such a place would be needed today. I mean, the, what would be needed is a good place for this type of interdisciplinary research. So now, at the end of this very um, uh, long presentation, uh, so I would like to uh, have an acknowledgement and I would like to express my thank you to anybody who has participated in those projects, but also who have helped 
uh, to create these uh, these slides and 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 uh, to collect these uh, materials together. So again, thank you. Well, let me just mention a few names, and I know this is not the whole list. So first of all, thank you uh, to Michaela Rossini from the YASA library. And uh, Michaela was kind enough to search and to select several original photos and documents, which I was able to build in. And this is an old picture actually from the YASA library at the time when we have uh, created the YASA gateway. Many thanks uh, to, to, the, to the key, key scientists or key implementer of the YASA TPA70X25 gateway network, and that was Albert Jalabadi. And then also many thanks to him uh, for uh, publishing uh, uh, several papers, and uh, I had the chance and privilege to publish uh, some of the papers with him. This is out of this paper, um, the uh, short curriculum vitae up to uh, 1980, 83 and so on, uh, where Albert came from. So he graduated the Technical University in Budapest and he went immediately to Stucky. And basically he was involved from the very beginning into computer networking applications. So he had early contacts with CDC in Minneapolis and then he had his first contact with YASA in 1977 with a computer networking uh, group. And then he has been associated and also as a full-time scholar uh, since, uh, in, since October 1979. <clears throat> and he has developed actually the YASA gateway together with his colleagues from, uh, from Stacke. Many thanks to Roger Rabian, who was the second director of YASA. And under his uh, regime, the development of the YASA gateway took place. And it was also a very difficult time uh, for YASA in general. And certainly his wisdom and, and his calmness helped very much uh, uh, that we, had, we, we could uh, complete uh, the project. So here on the left hand side, you can see um, Roger. On the right hand side, you can see Roger with the, with the um, uh, science minister, minister Miss, uh, Mrs. Fienberg uh, uh, from Austria. And actually this was, I think, 89 or 88 or 89 when, the, when a, a stamp, an Austrian stamp appeared. And this was the picture of the Austrian uh, stamp in a large format. And also many thanks to Bas Holling, to the third director of YASA. Uh, um, Bas had the difficulties to deal with the uh, quitting of the U.S. national member body or the replacing of the U.S. national member body with uh, another, uh, another institution from the United States. I think it was the uh, Academy, uh, American Academy of, of, of Art and I don't know, sciences, I think that was it. And certainly he was as patient as Roger was, and he has been also very helpful in getting over uh, all the difficult times. Last but not least, so many thanks to Peter de Janosche, so who was the head of SDS in 78, the YASA director later on in the 1990s. And uh, you can see uh, you can see Peter yeah, on the left hand side, and then in the, in the uh, left hand side, you can see the Yaza football team, where also Peter was, uh, I think he was, he, said, uh, he was the referee of a football game where uh, Russia or so the Soviet Union red played against England. Yeah, so um, I was with the two ladies uh, playing actually for England uh, for the simple reason that they didn't have enough players. Matthew Dean Dixon, so my co-partner in the YASA Secretariat. You can see it from the third one on from, from left. And uh, Sebu Bagdoyan and so on, also many, uh, uh, many, many thanks to him. Yeah. Susie Riley, uh, Sherry. So uh, great, 
Great, great team. Thanks. Well, here it is a collection of some of the references that were collected during this work. I do not claim that I have all the references, but a little bit I run out of of patience, if I may say so. So, so this is a bunch of further references, what you can read about Yasa's networking activities, and I am, but it, but it is not complete. The same continues also here. At so some point in time, you know, I had to finish. And that's the end of the list of references. And first of all, many thanks to Yasa or to everybody at Yasa. And this is a very, very nice picture of the Yasa Schloss and looking from the from the Schloss Pass Platz. And so this is the main entrance of the institute. And that's basically the end. I know it is a very uh, long presentation, and um, actually, um, actually, it is not even a complete uh, presentation. I try to find the old colleagues of mine who could have been contributed to this presentation. I was able to contact uh, some of the people at Yasa from the computer centers. And uh, I was able also to contact Albert Lavadi. So with Albert, I had a uh, long telephone uh, conversation. So thank you very much, Albert. So that was very useful. We also had early plans, especially on the Prague and Moscow line, and then how the connection to the Soviet Union, it became, uh, it became came to Yasa and what kind of difficulties were there and what the uh, com concrete history there was. Uh, first of all, because I don't know. I mean, I knew much better, you know, what we did at YASA around the TPA-70 and the external links to the to the Western European, North America, European countries and to North America. But the connection to Prague and to, to Moscow, it was it was done by the colleagues from, from the uh, Soviet Union at that time. So I very much hope that that somebody will come forward and also tell that very interesting part uh, of the story. And with that, now really I would like to make a completion of this presentation. And thank you very much for your, um, for your attention. Bye. Well, I have also for, um, provided some further reading in English, in German, and in Hungarian. Well, there, were not, there are not too many people who will enjoy the Hungarian one. But uh, about the networking development in those countries around that time, and actually you will find that the mosaic picture, what I have told, it, fit, it, it fits quite nicely together. And uh, there are some uh, papers included that later on, I mean 10 years later on, how internet moved into Austria and also how internet moved into Hungary. And uh, so as you can see, the predecessor of all these activities, not necessarily of the, of the uh, internet per se, but uh, to, to create such kind of culture and, and, uh, and to, to lay the foundation, actually the YASA gateway activities, what we did in the end of 70s, early 1980s, it was a very good foundation. This one is a description of data services of Radio Austria, who was one of the YASA's public career partners in Austria in 78. So they are describing it, how they saw it at that time. Then they also describing that the TimeNet engine, which was mentioned so much in this presentation, it was then replaced in uh, 1987, so much later, by a, C a Siemens ADXP. A computer, which again it was based on on PDP 11, 11 nodes. So uh, with the YASA gateway with TPA 70, you know we are not so terribly off. This one, uh, uh, this one is just an advertisement from the mid 80s from the Siemens ADP platform. 
in the US. This one is also quite interesting. This is the history of the Econet, Austrian Academic Network, practically which then took over all the computer networking connections from YASA and made, uh, made, it, uh, made the first internet connections, internet connection to Switzerland, internet connections to, uh, to, to other Eastern European countries after the 1990s, and uh, basically were uh, also YASA. Uh, uh, YASA Western connections were well, then linked into after the YASA Gateway has uh, served its, 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 its duties, so uh, starting from the early 1990s. This one is uh, in German just an interview text from Peter Russell, uh, how he saw uh, in 1990 uh, uh, the introduction of, of Internet. And uh, uh, so it also explained the connection to the East and West and the, the upgrade. So it was obviously a much higher speed than we were talking about it in the EASA uh, uh, computer networking activities of the 1980s. This is just a continuation of the Peter Russell interview. And um, and uh, yeah, about the creation of the Austrian Academic Computer Network, and then how uh, how the abbreviation Internet abbreviation AT uh, was requested yeah, from from the Internet. Again, continuation about introduction of email over the Austrian Internet, and that's it. Here, in this part, uh, Peter Russell described um, how in 89 and 90 uh, they provided also the links to the Eastern European countries, so, uh, such as Czechoslovakia, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, Hungary, and so on. So this was, uh, what I said, one generation later than what we have done at YASA. This is uh, what Peter Bakony um, described uh, about the internet in Hungary and then uh, uh, what happened after the YASA link and then the uh, TPA-based uh, Hungarian academic network. And this uh, also very nicely fits into uh, what the Austrian have said. Again, this is a continuation of it, and uh, describing it that also uh, how um, the, the IP network, so the internet in Hungary, it became H-bond, so a much higher speed uh, uh, a network, which, which provided a much higher speed internet connection within Hungary, but also interconnection at high speed uh, with the other internet, um, internet nodes and countries outside of Hungary. So this is also an Hungarian. Well, uh, this is basically me. So you can see the different. It was a build. Uh, it was a picture uh, that was taken in the 1970s. So exactly in the year when I went to to Yasa. So this was in 1978, and then this page basically describes all my um, history before. And uh, and until um, until I went uh, and worked with with Yasa. So basically, I was born in Budapest. I learned at the Technical University of Budapest, and I finished the Technical uh, University in Electroengineering in 1970, and then I also made there my PhD, which I have completed in 1974. So I joined then. When I finished in 1970, first the computer laboratory for the Institute of Coordination of Computer Techniques, SKI, which was at that point in time one of the leading computer in the research institute uh, of, of Hungary. 
So my special interest uh, was, uh, well, I went through hardware, maintenance, and then also software with system software and so on. And then from 74 to 77, I participated in a number of joint projects with Siemens in Siemens in Munich, Germany, and then between 78 and 1984, I worked at YASA, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. So first I worked in the Secretariat, so which was a management body of the Institute, and then as a scientist in the Computer Science Group, and, and then also, of the, also in the Systems and Decision Sciences area, that was where the Computer Science Group belonged to and then later on in the so-called management and technology area. So this is my prehistory uh, at, at YASA, what I did there.